So we're going to call the meeting to order of the Washington Central Unified Union School District at 6.15. Yeah. I'm going to wait just a minute to do the welcome because I need some adjustments to the agenda today. I would like to add an executive session after uh, before 2.3, before public comments. Uh, could I, is everybody okay with that? So much. Okay. Thank you, Ursula. Could I have a second? Second. second. Uh, Lisa is up there. Lisa, you decide. Who seconded it? <laughs> is that Michelle. you, Michelle? Sure. Michelle. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. So, uh, right now, I just first want to start by welcoming everybody uh, tonight. Uh, welcome to our meeting. Uh, we're going to be reviewing draft one of the budget. I want to begin first by extending a warm welcome to our community members that are here. There's a lot of community members online. <laughs> A especially welcome our dedicated staff at Washington Central Unified Union District. A, uh, even more special welcome to our leadership team who's been working really hard to present this budget for us today. And I was thinking that as we approach a, our sort of that Thanksgiving weekend a, where we are all grateful, I've been reflecting of what I am grateful for. And my thoughts always circle back to kids, whether they are my own or whether they are our incredible students or the kids around our state. Um, so um, with that in mind, I want to take a moment to express my heartfelt thanks to the leadership team for the immense work that you do every day for our students, because it takes a lot of leadership. And you guys have been working especially hard this past few weeks. So I also want to express my gratitude to the community who's staying engaged. We can see it by members here and members mm -hmm. online. And also my sincere gratitude, which I don't always say this often, but I am grateful for our school board members <laughs> for the hard work and the dedication that you all uh, uh, put in. It is noticed and appreciated. And finally, I would like to thank the staff for the incredible work that they put forth. I know that it's been a difficult day for a lot of people, but thank you for supporting our students and for all you do every day. Now, to put it all together, our shared commitment to public education and to all the students unite us and transcends any difference that we might have. So as we all know, education is a fundamental human right as far as I understand it, and is, and is rooted in equity, justice, and freedom. So these very principles are what sustain our democracy, which is so important. So together, we strive to create schools where every student feels safe, valued, respected, and truly welcome. So tonight, we ground our conversation in these shared values. So let's remember that we all have a wealth of different life experiences as we are here. As we discuss, let's approach with open hearts, avoid assumptions and create space to learn and grow together. And we always say to the kids, and I know teachers do this all the time, that you want them to be lifelong learners. So let's model that. Let's listen to one another and instead, you know, hear board members too. So, you know, extend grace and support to each other as we tackle this very important work. Uh, the overview for tonight's uh, meeting is we will start with a 15 minute public comment period after the executive session with two minutes allocated for every uh, person within those 15 minutes. Then we're gonna have our budget presentation and we have allocated 25 minutes for questions and answers uh, uh, from the community. And then at the end of the meeting, there will be a, another opportunity for the public uh, to give us input, just two minutes per person, however long that takes. So please be uh, kind and considerate as we engage in this conversation. This is challenging work, but it's gonna take teamwork and we will achieve our goals if we stay solution oriented. I know that I say this all the time, but you know, to stay solution oriented, embrace new ideas and remain grounded in our core beliefs and strategic plan as we move forward uh, together. So thank you for being here tonight. With that, I'm looking for a motion to go into executive session to include. I moved to enter into executive session to discuss the employment of an employee pursuant to 1 VSA section 1313A3 to include Stephen Dellinger Pate, Heidi Dimnick, and our council. 
legal Bernie counsel. Lim Bernie Lindbeck. Bernie Lindbeck. Bernie Lindbeck. Bernie Lindbeck. Bernie Lindbeck. Bernie Lindbeck. Second. Second by Patrick. Okay. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. So we had Michelle move to get our executive session. Yep. And Michaela uh, second. 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 second it. Okay. okay. So now I'm looking for a motion coming out of executive session. Diane? And the mics are, oh, yes, oh. they are on. <laughs> 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 Uh, the board moves to agree with the recommendation of the administration to enter into a settlement agreement permitting the resignation of an employee, and we authorize the superintendent to complete the settlement agreement. Second. Second. Okay. Moved by Diane, second by Patrick. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Abstain. Okay. We have two abstentions. Thank you, Bernie, for being with us tonight. Nice to see you. Nice. Okay. All right. With that, we can move into public comment. If you have a public comment that's not directly related to the budget, or if you need to say it now before we do the budget presentation, please go ahead and raise your virtual hand or your regular hand on <laughs> live. You're, you're welcome to speak now, Jay, unless you want to stay through the budget presentation and do it after that. Um, it's up yeah, to you. I'll, I'll, I'll speak now if I can. Yeah, so we're going to get you a mic and just introduce yourself. And, and we have three people online, and we're doing two minutes for everybody. We just have two other things, so I think you'll be okay. Go ahead. Well, Madam Chair and Superintendent and all the board members, thank you. Um, I'm here to, <coughs> excuse me, um, reinforce the importance of libraries. Um, our EMES library has been um, kind of cut recently. Uh, there might be more cuts coming, but the library is the pillar of our schools. And I want to just reinforce the importance of that. And hopefully uh, the board will move forward uh, supporting those resources because as an attorney, um, libraries have been my life. Um, it's my source of research. It's my source source of studies. And without libraries, I couldn't do anything. Um, my wife is the same as a physician. Um, my mother-in-law is also a librarian. Um, <laughs> books are very important. Um, so um, I guess that's what I wanted to say, support the library. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And we have uh, a couple of people online. Uh, Jill, if you would unmute yourself and introduce yourself. Hi, Hi can you hear me okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, good evening. I'm a teacher librarian at U32. Thanks for allowing me the chance to speak, uh, particularly in the cuts to our elementary library programs. Uh, from these positions isn't just a cut in FTEs. It equates to a huge loss for our kids. Each year, these positions are tipped away at creating a further divide in the scales we see at U32. It's becoming really <laughs> quite apparent. In the last four years, we've gone from three full-time elementary librarians in their buildings with another split between two. Uh, this proposal will leave us at zero. So there will no longer be a full-time librarian in your schools at the elementary level. Well, EQS standards say that one librarian for 300 students is uh, what's required. Um, doesn't equate for the technology services that your librarians bring. So right now, just tip of the iceberg, how is it possible at a one day FTE to teach multiple classes, administer assessments based on national standards? follow our material selection policy when purchasing new titles, read peer review articles, 
to choose titles that meet our community's needs, generate new curriculum yearly based on our Vermont State Book Awards, weed materials that don't support our humanity and justice goals, process new books, run programming to engage readers, shelve books which come and go daily, maintain Chromebooks and other building technologies, facilitate statewide testing, do bus duty, do lunch duty, recess duty, help students find their just right book, run staff PDs on new ideas and technologies, and provide a welcoming safe space for students to redirect and recover whenever they're in school. Just don't know how that's possible. This library programming is dynamic and integral to your school community. Our students depend on these being available. We all care about the success of our students and this success depends on their access to libraries and certified librarians. Because right now you only have one certified librarian in your elementary schools. And next year, that might not even be the case. But I really thank you for your time and really hope you can reconsider supporting your libraries. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jim. It is? Oh, Arlen, Arlen, sorry, Arlen. You were before Edith, I just go, got excited about seeing us today. Go ahead, Arlen, sorry. That's okay, I go would ahead. happily yield. Yeah, I would ahead. happily yield to Edith. <laughs> um, but can you hear me okay? Yes, we can yes. hear you. Okay. okay. Um, as I bet you can guess I'm going to talk about libraries. My name is Arlen Brookley, and I am a resident of Calis and the librarian and tech integrationist at EMES. I'm here tonight to speak to you about the impact of cuts to our library programs. As a result of the cuts that were made last year, our elementary library programs are more different than they have ever been in the last 15 years that I've worked in this district. Having a supported library and tech integration program allows you to do the following. This year at East Montpelier, we have 940 minutes of student instructional time every week. We, in the first two months of the year, 2,397 books were circulated, 107 new books were added. And up to this point, we've had three after-school book clubs attended by 93 students. Mm -hmm. This year, I'm helping to support the other elementary school librarians and have the opportunity to see firsthand how the cuts last year are impacting our schools. I know hard decisions have to be made as our student population continues to decline, but I want to caution you that these cuts will make it harder to attract and retain qualified staff. A few years ago, you had 51 years of combined professional expertise in our elementary libraries. I'm the only elementary school librarian who returned to Washington Central this year. We are really fortunate, truly, to have found people who are willing to step in and try to support library programs in our school, but we have not set them or our children up for success. These staff do not have the time or expertise to update the collections, engage students in reading a variety of texts, learn to use a library, and teach information literacy skills with the time and resources allocated. In the 21st century, we are cutting essential information and media literacy programming. The cut proposed to EMES will further reduce programming and opportunities at this school. And as a Calis resident, I am shocked to see in the budget presentation for tonight that there is no percentage of a librarian for that school at all. Even the status quo for the other elementary schools will, would mean that they would continue to lack adequate staffing to do the work needed to provide the resources and to teach and support all learners in our schools. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Harlan. Edith? Um, hello, my name is Edith Lane. I am a 12th grader at U32. I've been in the Washington Central District since second grade, and I'm also here to talk about the libraries. Um, I can attest that the library programming is both at East Montpelier and U32 have been crucial in my learning experience. I don't think I would be considering going into a STEM field without the experiences I had in elementary school with Arlen, Arlen um, in relation to tech. Um, additionally, my older sibling, George, who went through the U32 district as well, is working as an intern in some schools and their libraries they do not have libraries at those schools. And it is clear those students are suffering. And I'm concerned that the students in our district are going to start suffering from the lack of access to library materials, the lack 
of additional education outside of the classroom. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Eve. Thank you for being here. Okay, that is all the public comments uh, for right now. Thank you. Yeah. And now we're going to move into our budget presentation, draft one. So, Stephen, up to you and your team. Right. Thank you, everybody. For this is being here. Do we hold questions till the end? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, yeah, you're going to have a budget presentation. Board will ask questions during board operations. And questions on the presentation by the public would be have a preference at the beginning. That's okay. No, no worries. <laughs> this is there. All right. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here. And those that are online, we, we really appreciate that. So um, this is going to be a team effort. Um, so it's not you're not going to just hear from me, but you're also going to hear from other members of our leadership team. Um, you'll hear a fair bit from Suzanne, our business um, manager. And so um, so just want to let you know, we'll have a, a crew of people that are giving you information tonight. Um, we are going to have a Q&A for the public right after um, this presentation so that they can ask questions and the board will also have an opportunity um, a little bit later to uh, to ask questions as well. So I think we're uh, probably going to do pretty well here. All right. So our budget development timeline, um, you can, um, this is the same timeline that we've been following. We did make some modifications to it because we were going to look at drafts earlier, um, but but we have moved uh, to this time frame right now. So this is draft one. We'll have more community engagement on December 4th. Um, and then the December 18th, we'll be bringing a draft two based upon feedback from this presentation, the public, um, and some uh, more staff input as well. And so um, just a reminder of our mission statement exists to nurture and inspire in all students the passion, creativity, and power to contribute to our local and global communities. And just our uh, core beliefs that we um, that uh, we brought about as part of our strategic planning, which led to the goals of our strategic plan um, to build and nurture culture, well-being, and inclusivity, challenge, empower, and engage each student through evidence-based instructional strategies and curriculum and varied educational opportunities, and foster and commit to responsible leadership that engages the community and communicates transparently. Um, we're working on meeting these goals. I can assure you that we're not there yet, um, but that's our, our goals and what we want to be able to do. A reminder of uh, the Vermont AOE definition of equity, and just a reminder that our board has a policy on equity that we try to incorporate throughout our, um, our work on this budget. And then these were our budget building goals, which was to build a budget based on a framework for multi-layer system of supports and ed quality standards and focus our decision making on programs and services that meet the goals of the strategic plan, all while keeping our students at the center of every decision that we make. And so the board pro provided us with these parameters, um, remain under the spending threshold, de develop our multi-layer system of supports, consider configure configuration changes that support our criteria, frame budget decisions around meeting those goals, programmatic decisions around ed quality standards and equitable distribution of resources, and support the accelerate, accelerated growth for students from historically marginalized identities. And so, and that final one is the long-term financial sustainability of our district. With, this has definitely been um, one of our considerations as we've moved through this work, is how do we develop systems that will last and will be sustainable. So our projected local education spending in this budget is a 5.42% local education spending increase. And um, we developed, um, developed it to meet that MLSS needs. It is under the spending threshold and it's based on EQS and equitable distribution of resources. So I think Suzanne, this is you, correct? It is, All yeah. Right. Uh, we wanted to limit the increase in per pupil spending in district-wide services to no more than a 3% increase. Uh, this meant allocating $7,872 per district-wide LTW ADM to district-wide services. And Stephen's going to talk to us about what district-wide services include. Yep. So uh, in the last uh, board meeting, we talked about our district-wide services. Um, the executive administration, and we will go through each one of these and what part of the budget they are. 
Um, but I, I guess instead of reading all of these, you can see all of them here. And um, and so we're going to go through each one of these. You'll see the um, the amount of money that was allocated in each one of these areas and the staffing and uh, programs that go with them. And so that's the first part of it. Then we will move into the school based um, finances so that you can see what we did at individual schools. I would just reinforce as well the district wide services. Many of these are student directed and student focused. They're just things that encompass the whole district and are managed more from the district level than an individual school level. And so, so we're going to start off with the executive one. Excuse me a second here. All right. So the executive administration, we've defined this as the superintendent and HR offices. I am the district operations manager who oversees the aspects of IT, transportation, data reporting to the state <coughs> and federal government. This item, and, and you'll see this in each one of them, there's the dollar amount and that percent, 1.94% is the percent of the total budget. There's a chart later that will show you all of these together, but this, uh, this amounts to 1.94% of the total budget and it includes those five people. Um, so the superintendent, the executive assistant is the uh, administrative assistant, and then the HR director, benefits specialist, and that district operations manager. This will be kind of the general breakdown that you see throughout all of these next pieces. And then there's the Board of Education Services. These are services for you as a board, um, stipends for treasurer, clerk, and board members. I know that some of you may forego that. We appreciate that, but we do budget for it and includes estimates for consulting, legal services, our uh, district-wide property and liability insurance all fall within this category. All right, so Jen, we're gonna start our group. Right. Hank, I'll stand over here and I'll, I'll hold the mic and pass it to my comments when it's ready. So um, curriculum and staff development is... Uh, here we go. Yeah, there it's on. So, curriculum and staff development is budgeted at about four hundred thirty-seven thousand uh, dollars, just over one percent of the budget, and that uh, that. Uh, collection of services includes uh, my position at 1.0 OFTE, an instructional coach position, and the work of our equity scholar in residence. I just want to say a little bit, uh, you know that from the annual Title I meeting that we had last month, we've been funding for a while instructional coaching all through Title II, through federal money. And as I so told you last month, the dollars aren't going as far. And so this current budget includes 0.5 of funding in the local budget and then 0.5 of that position still through the federal grant. And, um, and the work that we do together, these positions, supports curriculum instruction, assessment, and professional learning across the district um, in support of our strategic plan, especially core values related to humanity, justice, belonging, and inclusion, and, um, and rigorous curriculum and instruction. Financial services. So financial services, in addition to financial management of the $43 million general fund budget that the board and community vote on, the financial services team provides services for cash management, grant management, accounts payable, accounts receivable, and payroll processing, including the filing of state and federal financial reports, such as 941s and unemployment reports. Uh, the team includes the business administrator, one financial accountant, an accounts payable accountant and a payroll specialist. Uh, administration is recommending that the IT director be reinstated in this budget. To support this addition, the administrative support position for the department has been reduced, as well as $50,000 previously allocated for outsourced professional services. The software budget was reduced by $63,200 over FY25, and the equipment budget remains at $330,000, which is a $253 per pupil uh, cost, which is actually in line with the $250 per pupil recommendations included in the September PICUS and Auden report prepared uh, by the Joint Fiscal Office or for the Joint Fiscal Office.
Uh, this is how much we've included in the FY26 budget for the capital fund transfer. Uh, it's a reduction from what was a little over a million dollars. I think I heard this correct. Yep. So community connections, we've talked about this program um, as part in conjunction with our pre-K program. And so um, you see that the, the, as a district, we only contribute a, a minor amount of money, $55,000 to this program. It's also funded through program fees, grant funds, and uh, DCF support, and provides limited before school and after care, after school care at four sites in the district. Um, many of the people, you see that there's there's a fair number of employees here. Those are paid from those other funds, obviously not from the just the 55,000 that we have um, allocated there. This is an area of our budget and our programming that certainly uh, needs us to think about what's the long term as we think about our pre-K programs and, and what we want those to look like at our school, as well as what kind of before and after school care that would require us to increase this in some ways if we were to add those kinds of services to our, uh, our schools. All right. So the budget includes a $160,400 transfer into the food service fund. Uh, this is an increase of a 1.0 head cook food service agent at U32 with the intention to move the former food service director position to a district wide position. This is also a reduction of 0.4 food service worker at Berlin based upon the meals per labor hour at the school. Once a food service director has been hired, the overall service delivery model will be analyzed to determine possible efficiencies that might be obtained through common purchasing, preparation, and food service delivery overall. The food service director will also be responsible for applying for various food service related grant opportunities, ensuring annual training requirements for all food service staff are met, and various food service regulations are being met, including health, hygiene, wellness, posting, and advertising. I would also just point out that this is not the total amount of money. It's also funded through federal, state, and, um, and other grant funds as well. Uh, building operations uh, represents 9.8% of the total budget. And you can see the list of staff that that includes here across the district. Uh, administration is not recommending a reduction in operations and maintenance personnel in this budget. The necessary support needs for operations and maintenance are calculated based upon square footage, which would indicate the district should have 29.42 custodians. Recommendations for maintenance and mechanics are one per 50,000 square feet, which U32 is a 200,000 square foot building without including Shapiro or central office. So you can see that our FDEs in, in uh, maintenance and custodial are far below those recommendations. All right, and transportation, we contribute uh, about four and a half percent of the budget to transporting our kids pre-K through 12. Um, and this is to school and home. Uh, we also tra uh, transport our kids to the Career Center um, and from Orange. Um, that's offset by some of our tuition revenues that we have. We also have lake buses, um, and this is also for field trips. Um, busing for athletics is a part of the co-curricular budget, not a part of the transportation budget. I, I put in there also the morning and afternoon ridership. Those are the number of students that are signed up. We also do, um, we do periodic checks to see this is definitely not the number of kids who are actually uh, riding the buses. That, that is much lower, but I wanted you to see how many have requested the service. And then we'll bring you a better transportation report around usage um, as we get a little deeper into the school year so that we can show you comparisons on all of that. All right, Julia. Hi. Um, so for special education, our budgeted amount um, that we're proposing for the fiscal year 26 is 10 million, just a little over $10 million, which is 23% of our overall budget proposal. 
Um, you'll see, obviously, there's a director of student support services, which is my position. You might be surprised to see an assistant principal listed there. And um, many of you probably remember Kat Fair, who is, was the principal at Callis for um, many years. She is now serving at what was the assistant director or school-based director of um, student special education at U32. And she's a licensed principal who's working toward her licensure for special education administration. So that's why that title looks a little bit different, but it's an, a position that was in the budget previously. Um, in, in looking at caseload sizes for next year and, and considering our student needs, this proposed budget includes a reduction of 2.0 FTE for special educators for next year. Um, what's always nice to see is that um, we have an unfilled position and a retirement, which means that that will not mean that anyone in our current team will need to be rift, which always makes us really happy. Um, this budget also includes a reduction of 6.0 um, FTE for paraeducator and behavior interventionist staff. I think that's it. Thank you. And then in addition to um, all of those other services, we, pay, we do pay tuition to the Central Rock Career Center and for Act 166, which are preschool tuition. So you see that's uh, just a little over a million dollars or 2.38%. Um, these numbers are approximations. We haven't had the final tuition numbers presented to us from the, the Career Center, but this is our um, approximation of those. It won't be vastly different. Um, that's there for us to see. So here you see that debt ser service uh, represents 2.26% of the budget and includes payments for principal and interest for Berlin, East Montpelier, and Romney long-term debt. So there's the pie chart that shows all the uh, categories um, plus the school-wide um, programs that we're about to get into. Um, and so... Um, but we also have it as a table that'll probably be a little bit easier to read. Um, so when we go to this, here's our table that shows you the school-wide programs are, are by far the, the largest percentage of the total, special education next, and then you can see the percentages from there. Um, and so we, we will get into that piece in just a moment, but that table gives you a breakdown of all those areas we just shared. All right. So as we get into the school program, so just a reminder that the framework that we um, that we used for this was uh, based upon class sizes and uh, building a multi-layer system of supports for our um, our students. And so as opposed to in the past where we started with what is a level service budget and we cut from that, we instead this year started from the ground up and said, what kind of services do we need for that initial instruction for all of our students? and to meet the needs of our students uh, for any kind of interventions and supports. And so when you look at this, um, as we're looking at the school-based budgets, just remember that this was built from the ground up as opposed to cutting from the top down on all of that. And so this gives you some of the, the numbers that we looked at um, as we were building our class sizes for our layer one and two. And, uh, and then what did the ed quality standards say around things like school counselors, library media specialists, and school nursing. Um, so our allocation of resources also included other expenses. So there were three categories that we looked at big, the layers one and two for MLSS, the layers three through six, and then those other expenses, which are those kind of non-instructional, but certainly support instruction in many ways. Uh, co-curricular field trips, supplies, all of those kinds of things. So that was the third category um, that contributed to the overall school uh, expenditures. And so with that, we, um, I think Suzanne, I'll let you yeah. explain this piece. So similar to the district-wide level uh, fund allocation, we allocated a per pupil or a per weighted pupil amount for the school level funds. And that amount was $8,236. Uh, which was based on uh, the excess spending threshold. Uh, this was the amount to keep the district under that excess spending threshold if, if the district-wide services did not increase by more than 3%. So where we allotted an increase of 3% for district-wide, we allowed the school level ones to go all the way up to excess spending, which was more like a 7% increase. 
The number of classrooms were determined based upon the proposed class size procedure. The MLSS layers one and two needs for additional staffing were determined based primarily on the EQS standards, but the PICUS report was used as a measuring stick for admin assistance and allied arts. Using the average cost of a teacher at $111,900, the impact of varying salaries and benefits was removed from the allocation. So using that average, and allotting that to the schools that way, it meant that no school was punished because they had a, a teacher that cost more. Uh, building administrators then had autonomy in determining the additional staffing needed to support students in MLSS layers three through six. And I think Celia's up with Berlin next. I know. I know. I know. See, I knew it. I was like, what? <laughs> All right. Um, so, our long term weighted average daily membership came out to 306.28 students. Um, and that ac accounts for all of those different factors that gives the really complicated formula that the state gives you, right? So that's why we don't actually have 300 students in our building, but that's how um, we got those numbers. Our projected enrollment next year is 181 students. As you can see, our per pupil spending comes in just under 14,000. Um, we can go to the next slide. So when we think about uh, what a student experiences at Berlin, we want to make sure that we are educating the whole child and that we are um, making sure that students are um, have their needs met from the very basic level to um, starting off every day. So um, we will do that by staffing our um, classrooms. We will have nine classroom teachers and four full-time interventionists. The way that that splits out on this screen, you'll see it's 11 point, I have nine uh, classroom teachers and then a preschool teacher that's a 0.84 FTE. And then we fund 1.8 and uh, interventionists locally. And the other parts of our interventionists are 2.2. .2, so that makes four interventionists total, two math and two literacy. That's why that number is kind of weird. Like how do you have 0.84 of a 64 of a person, Celia? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, our allied arts teachers, we will have a PE at a 0.8. We will have music at a 0.6 and art at 0.4. Those are the... Um, same numbers that we had last year. We will uh, utilize a 1.0 school counselor and um, we will maintain that school-wide behavior professional that the SEL behavior systems coordinator that is currently grant funded this year. Um, that has made a dramatic improvement in our system and our ability to meet student needs. Um, it, uh, it's a really fantastic team and it's working exactly the way that we had envisioned. So um, that's wonderful. So that's something we like to keep in our budget. Um, our school nurse is one, it will be a 1.0. Our library media specialist will be a 0.8 and we will have two general education pairs. Um, we're taking questions after, yeah? Yeah, Okay. Um, I would point out um, we included operations and maintenance within this slide, but that wasn't a part of the school's um, yeah. allocation, but we wanted you to see how it was broken out from the um, from the earlier slide. So you kind of know where are all those people at. So that's yeah. there for your reference, but it's not a part of what they had to budget for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When I look at all of the direct instruction and student support, um, one thing that we've worked um very hard. Our intervention team, those four interventionists have worked incredibly hard this year to build a really strong progress monitoring system. And um, we have been using different wind blocks in our building to provide both math and literacy instruction. We, I, I feel really strongly that the system that we have in place is supporting best student needs and we're seeing that in our um, in our data teams when we're looking at student progress. We're watching um, really, really phenomenal progress with some of our students who are really struggling. So that's super exciting. 
Um, when uh, I will continue to be a 1.0 uh, principal, and um, we did make a reduction to um, one of our um, admin assistants. Um, and we will continue to have 3.0. Um, we have a lead maintenance and then two custodial staff. And then when you look at our grant funded, we have 2.2 <coughs> interventionists and then a 1.0 school wide behavioral interventionist. So um, that is a paraprofessional that helps support the work. So I have the para and then I have my behavior systems coach and my school counselor and myself kind of work as a team of four to support to, to support student and student behavior in our building. Um, and I think that that's it. These, some of these uh, FTEs are more than what are recommended by in those calculations. So we, I use my discretion to in, increase those based on the student need and the systems and the systems of support in place in our building to really achieve that whole, um, whole child experience. Can you repeat there more than one? Yeah, he um, the the calculation that was ex sorry the calculation that was explained earlier sort of gave us our building up budget and then our individual discretion comes at. So EQS would have not had a full time yep. school counselor um, yes. at the school, but based upon the needs, the MLS needs uh, three through six, um, the school has decided to increase the school counseling. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Celia. Yeah, no problem. All right. Chalice. <laughs> Perfect. Alphabet. All right. Good evening. Um, so, Callus, um, you can see a bunch of numbers. Because um, no one can explain it. She's right. Like, that's, we're moving on. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, it's, it's late. Know, like okay, just, sure. Um, so the first thing I want to say is that Callus, we really appreciate the people that we have. Um, we have a really strong staff, uh, professional staff and para educator staff. We have um, a high number of para educators for our um, number of students. It's roughly 10% of our students have one-to-one -one para educators. Um, so we have a lot of adults in the building for being a smaller school. Um, but we really do appreciate the people that we have in the building. And that allows us to provide for our students the best we can in what is the EQS. And so our numbers here um, match the EQS pretty right on. Um, so current classroom teachers and interventionists is 6.7. That is what we currently have today. Um, our allied arts, that is one day of library, two days of PE and one day of art and one day of music. So that is, and that is what we currently offer um, today. Um, the two you see that are, are lower than what we have right now are school counselors and school nurses. Um, when we talked about this as a staff, while of course they, they want those right services, it was about the tier, the layer one and two and focusing on the instruction in the classroom. And we wanted to keep the amount of staff that we have to maintain the classroom and the learning environment. The, of course, there are places there with school counselors and school nurse that we know do affect that. Um, but with us being a smaller school and needing to fit in what we can, we believe the best thing we can do is to maintain those teachers and those interventionists. Um, so we are, that is, this is our current set up as is, and it basically remains the same. Um, I am 0.9. It hurts a little bit because it makes me feel like not a whole person, <laughs> um, which is normal. Um, uh, administrative assistant and our operations, our, our custodial staff, um, that is current. And then the grant funded position, we have a behavior interventionist at 1.0 that again is not part of our larger number our per pupil number um, that we have that's funded outside of that. Suzanne. I would just add that there is a library media specialist oh, yes. budgeted at 0.3 that's missing from this list. So apologies for that. Yeah, it's part of that Allied Arts 1.0, I believe. If not, we do have library. We have, we have a, the uh, retired librarian from Cabot School. Thank you, Becca. Um, who is fantastic, but she is there one day a week. She's there on Mondays. So, and that is part of this whole thing. So we do have library. 
Um, we don't have the technology part, but we do have library. So clarification, is the point three included in the point, uh, in the 1.0, or is it point three should be added on? I believe it's added on, but let me double check. Yeah. Okay. Just because we yeah. And just so yeah, you know, SW it. means school wide. Just, okay. yeah, because I know we use that a few places. All right. So we're, we're mathing. <laughs> But yeah, no. <laughs> uh, it includes a point two art, point two music, and point six PE help. So it's in addition to the allied. Okay, so yeah, it'd be yeah. An, yeah. an added yeah. to one point three. Yeah. yeah, but it is again, it is our what we have now and what we believe we can we can do with to to do what's best for our students. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you, Jared. Yep. Thank you. All right, Dodie. <laughs> Okay, so I've just shown my age. Um, okay, so <clears throat> for Doty, um, this is the slide with the numbers on it. Um, one thing I do want to point out is about the per pupil spending, which looks, you're like, whoa, that looks a little different from everybody else's. And part of that is because the allocation that we got that is also based on student need and the factors that Stephen and Suzanne mentioned um, was how we came up with the 1,076,000. Um, but because our enrollment is projected to be lower next year, that's how you get the bigger number. So I just wanna point that out um, because it when I first saw it, I was like, oh, but, um, then we talked through it and it made sense because the spending allocation is based on student need. And Gillian, 62 is, per, I mean, I feel like Dodie's had different numbers every time. 62 is the current, next year's projected. That's net, yeah, based on this year's, it's actually gonna be 63 um, because we have somebody moving in, yay. Um, but that's six of one. Mm -hmm. So for classroom teachers and interventionists, we're at 5.02. The 02 is because of um, a pre-K position, which would be 0.42. Represents no change. Uh, just to briefly mention, because I understand there may be questions about preschool at this point. Um, we don't know how preschool is going to be structured next year because it's too early to tell because of numbers. We never know how many three and four year olds there really are at this point in the year. Um, allied arts, there are no changes in allied arts. So I have, Dodie has 0.4 PE, 0.2 art, 0.2 music, 0.3 live. Point four, sorry, point four library media. I currently have point three filled of that. Uh, school nurse, this for next year, currently this year, I have budgeted a 1.0 position. I've been unable to fill it. I have it filled with um, point five. And I believe that I can meet the needs with 0.6. Ideally, what I'd like to be able to do is to be able to have that 0.6 spread over five days. Um, so that's the dream. Uh, 0.7 school counselor. One thing you may notice is uh, school counselors across the district are not created. They're not, they're, the positions can be very different. And <clears throat> they have sort of evolved over time you know, sort of going back pre-consolidation. And so the Doty uh, school counselor has traditionally also been the school-wide behavior support person who, so she does a lot of sort of the pre-teaching and coaching um, stuff around behavior. Our school counselor is also supplemented so she will be a total of 1.0 because she has the 0.3 from grant funding through Medicaid. And this was an allocation I feel really good about. Our school counselor is really with Act um, 173. We're doing a lot of stuff with functional skills, with executive functioning, with social thinking. And our school counselor is doing a lot of not just guidance classes, 
but also doing some targeted and intensive intervention with students around um, <clears throat> executive functioning, social thinking skills, and things like that. I, Sorry. Oh, so that, so there is no change there. The only change in FTE at Doty is the nurse, and that is not actually at this point a functional reduction. Um, my FTE stays the same. Admin assistant at Doty is 200 days. Operations and maintenance is 1.5. The 0.5 represents a shared position with Rumney. And our intervention is 1.0, which is Title I funded. And that position is both reading and math. Thank you, Gillian. All right, Eastmont Pillier. Hello. So next year, it looks like we're going to have 182 students. That is quite a significant decline to this year. We're graduating 36 sixth graders at the end of this year, and our numbers look like we'll be welcoming hopefully around 18 kindergartners next year. So we're losing quite a few students. Um, Long-term weighted ADM has helped us here because we also don't receive any grant funding. So thankfully, it looks like we have 315 students next year. Looking at the changes um, for next year, and a lot of we we do have some changes in a lot of different areas that I'll go through with you, and and that does have to do with the decline in our enrollment for next year. Currently, we have ten classroom teachers, and this um, proposal to you this evening has us with nine classroom teachers, K through six, a point eight four pre K teacher, and then four interventionist, which um, very similar to Berlin. Um, brings us up to 13.84 teachers and interventionists. 2.0 um, allied arts teachers, there's no change in PE, art, um, music, or health for next year from this year. That stays the same. School counselors, we currently have a 1.0 school counselor. Prior to COVID, we had a 0.6 that we shared with Doty. Ed quality standards would say we should have a 0.7 for next year. Um, I don't like non-even um, numbers, a 0.7, a half day is really hard. Uh, so I made the recommendation to move that up to a 0.8, so four days a week for a school counselor. It's one day less than this year. The school-wide behavior support, the behavior coach at East Montpelier truly makes it possible for me to do my job every day and um, do not recommend that going away anytime soon. Our school nurse position, we um, at quality standards would say we should have a reduction in school nursing. The needs of the students in our building, we have a lot of acute health needs. Um, I do not recommend cutting that position at all. Um, and then you heard from Arlen and other community members, past students, uh, about the library media specialist. This year in the budget, we have a 1.0 library tech integrationist. Um, and as Arlen shared with you, half of a day a week actually is spent supporting the district. That wasn't a shift in the budget this year, but it was a shift in her time. And that was really because um, we lost the librarians in the other schools and Arlen is the one licensed librarian at the elementary schools. And she spends a half a day of her week this year really supporting the people serving in those positions across four, um, three of the other elementary schools. This recommendation, one thing that I committed to Arlen and I will say tonight, um, because it is a loss in our building, is that it will be a loss to the adults in the building and not a loss to the children or programming. We rely on Arlen to do a lot. She's been here for 15 years and she helps us with a lot of tech needs in our building. And that's the place that I think the adults are going to feel the pinch in having to not go to her for everything. Um, but I do not believe that programming for students will be impacted. And then the general ed paras 1.2, those are our pre-K paras who serve in our pre-K program. Principal, um, that doesn't change. It'll continue to stay full time. The other place where there is a reduction, currently we have a 1.6 admin assistance and the recommendation is to reduce that to a 1.2. Um, the recommendation based on PICUS numbers was actually a 0.9 FTE and admin assistance. Um, I don't like those odd numbers, and I also didn't feel like that was 
going to be feasible for eSmell players. So the recommendation is a 1.2. Operations and maintenance hasn't changed. The one last thing I want to say that you don't see on here that Julia talked about is a decrease of two special educators district-wide. One of those will be coming from East Montpelier. Um, thankfully, as she said, that doesn't mean a riffing situation, but it does mean East Montpelier will have one less special educator. Okay. Thank you, Alicia. Can just, you just break down for me the allied arts teachers? Sure. Yeah, so... Um, we have a 0.8 FTE for PE, a 0.2 in health, a 0.4 in art, and a 0.6 in music, and then a 0.8 in library. So these are the numbers for Rumney next year. I would highlight the per pupil spending as um, it's the least of the elementary schools, but we don't compete. But I'm just pointing that out. Is it a little bit of a gold star would feel good after some conversations. Yes. Um, next slide. So the 0 .802. Uh, this is our 0.42 pre-K teacher, six classroom teachers, and 1.6 interventionists. So we will keep the same number of classroom teachers as we have this year. We will have two classroom teachers for grades K-2, four classroom teachers for grades three through six, and we will have a total of 1.6 intervention. This is 0.8 or four days a week for literacy and 0.8 for math. Then we will have, uh, I didn't break out the allied arts teachers, um, so I might come back to that if, um, if I remember, if I forget and you want it, let me know. Um, but we will have three days a week for nurse and three days a week for school counselor. That's a, an increase over what EQS had recommended, um, but I advocate for it because my thinking was that this way, the school always has either a nurse or a school counselor, and they have one day that they overlap so they can coordinate student plans. Um, our library media specialist, this year we have 0.1 that is unfilled, and so the 0.4 um, is a reduction, but it reflects what we currently have. And then we will continue to have our school-wide behavior interventionist. Um, that's an ESP position. And the additional supports are the same next year as they are this year. So that's 90% um, of a principal, um, a 210-day administrative assistant, and the 2.5 for operations and maintenance. Okay, so back to the Allied Arts. I don't have it written, but I know we have 0.4 PE. 0.4 music, yep. school counselor's already in there. 0.2 art, does that equal 1.0? Yep. Four, mm -hmm. four. Oh, that's it, then I got it, okay. And that's all, thanks. I'm just waiting, you look like you had a question. All right. All right, thank you, Caroline. All right, next is Becca with you 32. Right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to maybe talk about this a little bit differently. And so you have all these numbers, but I want to talk a little bit about my approach to budgeting and how I think about this um, as somebody who's new in your community, but also has done this a little bit before, too. And so some of this has been messaged to staff also, is that when you're in um, sort of the ideal situation, um, mission, vision, and values really do drive programmatic decisions, which then drive structures, which then we put our money where our words are and we create budget. And we are in a moment where sometimes our budgeting constraints are driving backwards that information. So we're, and I think that that's important to note and to talk about because we want to be able to be in that place where mission, vision, and values are driving our programmatic decisions and they are sustainable over time. And so every time I enter a budget conversation, that's what I'm thinking about. And so I think it's important that you know that 
um, and that folks in the community know that, that that's where my head is all of the time, is how do we get to a place of sustainability so that we are fiscally, structurally, and programmatically sustainable? It means that we're not changing every year. It means that we have sort of a plan year over year, and we can think about the long-term way in which young people engage in our community, which is really what it's about. Um, and so when I look at these numbers, and when I'm given a task to build a budget from the ground up, I think about the priorities for our school community. And as I've learned those priorities, they really are aligned to your strategic plan already. And that is that the development and implementation of rigorous and relevant instruction that prepares students for college and career through paths that they get more and more choice in as they get older is important in this community. And so we want to make sure that our budget reflects the efforts to sustain that over time. Access to arts and elective programming that allows students to create and express their unique selves is essential to the kind of work that we want to do around inclusion and inclusive practices. It's also essential to who we are as a school community. And we see that and we'll hear from our student report about the musical that's happening. That is really important. And then the third priority is that in a building that is as large as this one physically, despite the fact that our population is getting smaller, it is really important that we are able to employ people who know young people really well. And we have structures and systems that support that. So making a large community feel small through teams, great teams, TA and restorative practices led by our counseling staff also is a priority. Okay, so I'm gonna to go to the next slide and then I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what's reflected here and what may not be reflected. Okay. Um, what is not reflected here, except in the athletics director and trainer is the, what I have heard as an importance on third space um, access or co-curricular access for young people. And I wanna name that, that right now that's reflected in our athletics program primarily, but it is not currently reflected in this space. So our teachers and interventionists and our community members spend a lot of time trying to build spaces for young people that are, that are co-curricular spaces. Um, but that's not currently reflected in here. So I just wanna put that in your mind. Um, What's also not reflected here is that in order to do all of this work in a sustainable way, we need to consider how we, how we structure our collective work. In this case, what this means is that things like operations, so our office supports, which is a reduction year over year, we need to do the work of how we operate this building differently. That doesn't mean that we can't do it with the people that we have. It just means we need to do it differently in order to create sustainability fiscally, programmatically, and structurally. The same is true for nursing and health in this case. Um, and that means that we really just need to, we are going to be in a position to need to revisit how we wrap around students in a way that they feel seen and heard. It doesn't mean it's not possible. It means that it might meet, be an effort to do things differently. It just It doesn't mean just doing more or asking people to do the same. It means doing things differently. Um, and then as just the last thing I'll say, you have these numbers. I'm happy to talk about more specifically, but I believe that we can do the work of running this school community in the way that you envision with this budget. And I also believe that we are going to need to rethink how we do the work um, so that we create the ability to grow and shrink. Um, we create the ability to bring on the sixth grade if, we, if that is something that you decide or we decide collectively we need to be able to be malleable. And I think that really focusing on um, not the decline or the loss, but what are the possibilities with the people we have in the building and the budget that we're given is really an exciting opportunity for U32 um, with those priorities in mind. 
And so that looks a little different than what my colleagues did. Um, I apologize for that. Some of that is just like my brain thinks in that way. Um, and also I know you have the numbers and so you also need to have the story. Um, so I hope that's helpful. And I'm happy to answer questions as they come up as we are in conversation. Okay. Jot down your questions there if you're thinking of them right now so yeah, that we can ask those in a bit. All right. So thank you to all of the principals um, and their hard work. This budget was built because we asked them to start from scratch. And so you saw their some of their thinking and some of the hard work that they did. I mean, huge kudos because I asked them to do something very different this year than they've done in the past. And so uh, you just got to see a glimpse into all of that. All right, Suzanne. Yes, sir. Uh <laughs> Just a reminder that the budgeted expended, uh, expenditures are the amount that the district plans to spend, which is the dollar amount that is warned and voted on. So that first section expenditures. This draft of the budget projects that the district plans to spend $43,123,740 in FY26, which is a 3.51% increase over FY25. The current revenue estimates for FY26 are $7,091,290, which is a 5.22% reduction, primarily resulting from the use of $485,000 in fund balance as an offsetting revenue in the FY25 budget. As noted earlier, there are still unknown revenue and expense numbers, which will be updated as the information is received from the AOE. The net education spending of $36,032,450 is the amount that needs to be raised by property taxes and is used to develop the local spending per pupil that the homestead tax rate is based upon. This represents a 5.42% net increase. Uh, just a note, the December 1 letter from the tax department will provide an estimated property yield and this number uh, will be used to provide projected tax rates in December. However, the common level of appraisal is not usually published until the end of December or even early January. So those impacts will not be known until January. And I would just stress here again, the expenditure increase of 3.51%, that's inflation. And so uh, the work that you've seen um, from everyone in this district to bring in um, expenditures that are at a reasonable level. Um, this really does meet where the inflationary index is at this point in time. And that our, our revenues is where the, the other increase comes from, is that loss of revenue by having to use the fund balance in, in a one-time uh, way last year. Um, so uh, we do feel like we've presented a responsible budget that meets our student needs, which brings us to the questions because I'm sure that those are out there for everybody. We, we, we promised questions to the public first, so we're going to open it up for, yeah. for people in the public and online, and, uh, yep. uh, and then we'll do the long way to... Okay. Yeah, yeah right, we'll do the see. other memo. Let after. me stop the share. Do you want to do the long... So, um, weighted memo first, or do you want to? Yeah, let me just take a quick moment. So, the long term yeah. weighted average, um, we put a, uh, a memo in the um, board packet that mm -hmm. explained the, uh, the long term uh, weighted average daily membership. I got to remember which page that's on. Yep, thank you. On page 13 in the, in the board packet. And so, this just shows. Um, the uh, the weighting factors that were done to determine those needs. So why you saw a difference in the uh, per pupil amounts that were uh, given to each of the schools that was based upon grade levels, the number of economically disadvantaged students, any ELL students or, or multilingual learners, as we refer to them now, sparsity across our district, we're a rural district. And so there's some funds that are allocated for that and small schools, um, which um, all of our elementary schools fell into some part of that category as well. Um, Berlin, East Montpelier and Romney were in one uh, category and Callis and Doty were in a separate uh, category. And so this just helps you kind of see what, how did we um, allocate funds according to needs? Those are the needs that we used um, to determine that. So, go ahead. Um, so based on that, I'm curious why we still are, um, Kind of publishing the per pupil spending per school. 
So the the per pupil for the actual pupils, because we we do need some way to look at it. I, I want this. I, I want to be very clear. We we publish that so you can see a comparison between them, but that should tell us the relative difference in needs of our students. That is not a this school costs more or costs less. It's the needs of the students within those schools are different, and that per pupil allocation shows that. There's also a little bit of a hold harmless that's a part of the formula. And um, that was referred to kind of quickly by Alicia about um, the long-term weighted average daily membership is a two-year average of this year and last year. And so as schools decline in enrollment, there's a little bit of a hold harmless. So to speak to the one school I know that you're asking about, which is Doty, it's at 17,000. If Doty had 70 students instead of 62, that number would be closer to 15,000. So that decline in enrollment is, um, it, there's a cushion there in the funding based upon that long-term weighted average daily membership. And then there's a higher need for some of the students that are at the school. And so those two go together. Those numbers will adjust over time, depending on student needs and student population. So Patrick, I see your hand, but I, I feel that I promise yeah. public to be the first ones to us. So I mm -hmm. want to hold yeah. ourselves to that. Yeah. And then we write your question as board members will have time to ask more questions. So I already, I don't see any hands here. No. So I'm going to start uh, online. So Kara, do you want to, how are you, Kara? Hi, thank you so much for all of that information. Um, uh, so my question is that, um, I understand that the many of the building principals did outline the cuts. I'm wondering if someone can summarize the specific staffing cuts uh, in each school. Um, I know that people would appreciate that. Thank you. So we don't have a chart for that in this budget. Um, we talked about building our budget from the ground up. And so we did not do a chart of the cuts. These are the necessary positions. I know there was some uh, talk in each one of these, but we can bring that, we can bring a chart. I mean, that's not how we built the budget though. It's not a cutting budget. Well, yeah. you know that there are cuts? Yeah, we, yeah, we outlined some of those cuts. Can we hear what they are? I don't have all of those in front of me right this moment. And, and that is not our job to decide who gets cut or not but gets it, cut. That's mm -hmm. not part of how we as board members uh, are going to look at this budget. It's a piece of information that is important for our community to Please understand. Please speak into the microphone um, for the online the people. Sorry. It's a piece of information that's important for our communities to understand and to know where the cuts are occurring. And it, you know, we got it last year. Um, very, yes, we did, very specifically. Yeah, we did, and then. Um, and it's, it's helpful to have for the communities uh, knowledge um, okay. and the staff knowledge. I, I, you know, it shouldn't be opaque. We'll bring a chart of those, and but we'll get that chart out before the next board meeting. Yeah, Becca. Yes. Um, I think Becca. Hi everyone. Um, I don't know if you can see me or not, but anyway, um, I have a I have a couple of questions. Um, I think sort of informally during the conversation, folks did break out the individual allied arts for each school, but if that could be part of the next chart or the next set of information so we can actually see how much of an FTE each type of allied art is is going to be in each school. Um, and as an aside, is PE an allied art? And I, I'm curious about sort of the nomenclature there and it just was interesting to me. So um, having a breakout so we can really see, you know, point two of art um, fine art instruction at Rumney versus, you know, some of the other allied arts. So that would be really helpful. Um, and then um, it would be, I think, really helpful for me to have um, sort of a larger explanation. I know we went through the transportation costs um, and special education costs um, district-wide, but I know that those are, are paid for generally by categorical aid from the state. And I know there's been some changes to the way that the um, special ed funding works. And so I'm curious to see sort of how that interfaces um, with the actual budget that the town is responsible for raising. So if there could be a little bit more, I think, explanation of that or just some numbers on how that sort of shakes out for us. Like those are, the transportation is a big number and but seeing how it actually would be taken off the top of the costs that we have to raise would be, I think, helpful. Um, and that's sort of separate from the long-term weighted averages, which are also, you know, sort of in the mix of how much we end up having to raise um, in our towns. Um, and then I think the final thing is not a question, but 
Yeah, it is a question, actually. <laughs> I'm curious what the administration and the district um, and sort of the, the board and is doing to advocate um, perhaps with the legislature for more categorical aid or to remove some of the costs that are outside of district's control. You know, I, I recognize that our this this number is only up by inflation, but but the reality is that healthcare costs are up by something like 17%, right? Or health insurance costs. So we're having to sort of make up that difference in our budget. And um, so many of these things are outside of our control, the health insurance, the mental health needs, which have gone up exponentially. Um, and, you know, we need, we now understand that we need nursing in our, all of our schools. And so I'm just curious if there's a, a plan to try to advocate to get some of those costs removed from the amount of money that we have to raise um, in our individual towns so that we can actually focus on um, student instruction rather than having to absorb these costs that are rising much higher than the instructional costs and, and are really unsustainable. So, Thank you. Uh, thank you, Becca. I know she asked a lot of questions, so I don't know, I, and I'm the only one I can answer is the last one. <laughs> so I could start with that if you want to. Yeah, I, I would say that um, one of the big questions I heard is just breaking out the revenue um, into what are the categorical aid uh, areas that we have in each of those. And I think that uh, we can certainly bring that. We don't have that with us right this second, but just breaking out where, is, where are our monies coming from, and we can show that a little more clearly. And then as far as advocating, we uh, both, the, the, not both, but everybody, Superintendents Association, Principals Association, Vermont School Board Association are all uh, lobbying for all of the, especially healthcare. We're hoping that this year we will be able, I keep looking at a computer, but I don't know which camera to look, but we will be uh, hopefully this year with the climate that we have and the context that we have, maybe we could move the needle in uh, in healthcare, especially. We don't know if that's gonna be a possibility, but we're also all testifying. Uh, Stephen has just reached out to, I, I, we've been writing memos to the Commission of Education. Uh, I'm doing an interview on Friday. We are all like as fast as we can trying to figure out how we can get, uh, you know, and leadership has changed so we can go on and on, but yes, you're well represented on, on any front, principals, superintendents, school boards, uh, yeah. <coughs> now, uh, Laura Lee. Thanks, is there a way to turn off the volume? Yeah. One of our yeah. and, and, and so we hear from the owl. I mean, just but it's just because uh, with the owl, we were not able to hear. It was we really low hear. last no, year. No, he wants to hear the zoom. No, the, the people yeah, online are calling in. He's turning that. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Laura Lee. I, I was wondering, sorry, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to the food service plan um, for the elementary schools, because Callis has an outstanding plan and I'm an outstanding chef who does a lot of amazing things. And I'm wondering if the budget plan can, is a way to continue to finance the individual school lunch programs, or if that's gonna be changing. I would say it's kind of a two-step approach that we're looking at. The first thing we need is a food service director that can help us coordinate that, whatever that plan may be. We don't have a good solid plan on long-term sustainability for our food service program, but having a district-wide director would help us move in that direction. And so that was one of the proposals within this budget was to, to have that position to look at, do we provide food? Do we, um, I'm sorry, do we cook all the food at each of the individual schools or is it um, something that we might want to centralize within a couple of schools and do delivery? Um, we know that these are all possibilities. None of these are off the table and I am not a food service director expert by any stretch. And so having someone um, who has that talent and has that understanding and can look at our system as to how we can buy better um, serve better and uh, and meet a long term sustainable program would be our is our goal for that. So I don't want to say that it won't happen, and I don't want to say that it will happen at this point in time because I really truly we need somebody who knows how to do this, and we don't have that person yet, and that's what we're going to be looking for soon. When you say when you say soon, are you, is it currently posted? We're um, I don't think we have it. We don't, we're about to post yet. it. Yeah, we're we're finishing up the job description for it. Um, 
So it's taking the food service director that was previously at U32 and making it a district-wide position. And so we just want to tweak the job description before we post it. So, so it's just not a new position. No, it's okay, one that has I, existed just, in the district. It almost sounded like it might be. And I just want position. to clarify that. Yeah. Right. Okay. The, the position that is added to the food service budget is a head cook at U32, which will replace what was a food service director. And now the food service director will be district wide. Okay. And currently the food service budget includes a, a cook at Callis, but with that food service director, we want them to be able to analyze uh, the food service delivery model and see if that's going to continue or not. Would, would those be potential changes for this budget or next year's budget? Uh, yeah. Currently Maybe. it's currently it's got the cook in there. Yeah. Okay, right. Yeah. Okay. At each school, okay. just to come back to yeah. Orly's question. Yeah, it, it's in there. That doesn't mean that this food service director wouldn't identify a change before, if we hire that person now and they identify a change that we can implement before the next school year, that might be different. Okay. Heather and then Ruben. Oh, Heather just disappeared. Or, no, there you are. Okay, Hi. go ahead. Hi. Hi there. Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. I'm Heather Scandale. I live in Callis. And I was just looking at the different ratios, the school counselor to per pupil ratio. And I'm just a little more curious about it um, because most, except I think U32 are over, like they have more, the percentage is higher per pupil because the, the recommendation is 250 students per one school counselor or Vermont is unique where it's 187 or six students per uh, school counselor. And so my question, I'm just curious about the roles and responsibilities and just how they differ in each school because some schools are having a 0.8 or a 0.7 with a really low ratio. That's just one wondering. And then I'm wondering, um, does the school counselor, is he or she in the master schedule? Meaning, is there time <clears throat> that their class is being delivered? And that is maybe the teacher's prep, or, you know, prep time per their contract. And do those correlate? Those two things correlate. I work in a school, we have 325 students and I'm the only school counselor, but our roles and responsibilities are really defined and it, it feels manageable. And so I'm just curious a little bit more about that. Thanks. I'm, I'm looking to the crew back there. Celia, somebody would like Celia or just... So I'll speak to that. This is Gillian um, from Jody. And um, I don't know that I remember all the parts of the questions and there was a question about correlation that I know I can't answer. Uh, on In the elementary level, school counselors do teach a guidance class um, every, uh, and it, it varies a little bit in the schools in terms of how it's structured in terms of the, whether or not it's once a week or it's taught more frequently in, in blocks you know, sort of in like six week blocks or things like that. So, but all students, all elementary students in across the district get the same amount of guidance class. It's just not like, for example, every, you know, it's not that every student in the district has PE twice a week, but that's not how we do it with guidance. Guidance is not an opportunity for teachers to have planning time uh, in the elementary level uh, classroom teachers are expected to participate and be part of the guidance class um, so that they're aware of what are the skills and things that students are working on. And I think also, as I mentioned, as the positions have evolved and sort of based on who has traditionally been in the positions, uh, particularly I'll use Dodi as the example, is my given my school counselor's um, particular skill set, her job even uh, predating my time at Doty had had sort of increased in terms of her role and responsibilities that are sort of beyond those of a traditional school counselor role. 
to incorporate the behavior and the social thinking. And so that's why there's the variability because where you might see at Doty, you're gonna see a higher FTE of school counselor, but you're not gonna see an additional FTE of a behavior support person. Thank you, Gillian. Or did you wanna say so you wanna add to it? I think I would just say in each building, like there, to Gillian's point, there there is a some sort of a class, whatever that looks like. And then in the other times, there are small groups and interventions that are taking place and that general like, um, following of the like American school counselor like guidelines, I always mess it up. Is it ASCA? Yes, ASCA. I always say ASHA, and that's the anyways. That's the SLPs. <laughs> um, but we try really um, hard to meet those, and and the the schedule looks different um, every every week. Um, but for our building, I think the EQS. To your point, I think you said you were one one school counselor to three hundred seventy five. I think mine looked like a 0.7 school counselor, and um, right now the needs of my building are that of such. I, my I need a one point school counselor to to meet the needs and work with that behavior team. So those are just like, and we we utilize that in small groups and such. So I think that that's similar in in many of the buildings. Thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, Ruben. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Hi all. Um, first, uh, thank you again. I I know these conversations are difficult and frustrating, and um, it's this is a small community. Every one of these conversations is personal to somebody. Um, I I think it's really important when we're talking about budgets, though to be mindful of the fact that it is a very small community and it is, uh, it's really important to keep centered on positions and um, functions and student outcomes and not personalize these cuts. Every single cut is personal to somebody, but it runs a real danger of turning into a popularity contest um, when you start to actually list positions and names that are being um, that are on the chopping block. Um, and that really dovetails into my my overarching point, which is that the people who know how to make any difficult budget conversation the least impactful to students are the professional administrators in the district. We have an incredible team of professional admins who know exactly what they're doing. And when they say these are the least painful cuts, I think it is the job of this board to believe them. This board has a long history over the past long time, including the time that I was on it, of not taking the advice of our professional administrators. And what ends up happening is that we end up undercutting them. And eventually what happens if you do that long enough is you have a budget that goes down for the very first time. I really hope that that doesn't happen again. Um, and I would strongly recommend that this board listen to your professional admin team as they do the work that they do. And, and uh, Rebecca, thank you for your incredibly concise and um, well put framing of how you developed this budget because sustainability is key. And having these whiplash conversations about this program and that program, it distracts from the larger, broader context of we are not in a sustainable place and we haven't been for a long time. And we keep kicking that sustainability can down the road and we really need to stop doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben. Hey, Noah. Thank you, uh, Noah Weinstein from Worcester. Um, on the on the question of sustainability, um, in terms of the the, the part time FTE positions, um, I'm curious if there's continued consideration around either sharing certain positions between schools, so that maybe the you know if there's a part time art or music teacher that you know maybe that position is going to be shared between two schools, so that somebody could actually be looking at having closer to a full time job within the district, even if they're only part time per school and or um, having, you know, th th this concept of having um, 
having teachers or staff members wear multiple hats within the same school. So if you have a part-time, you know, music and part-time art position or something like that, that maybe we're looking at how do we get somebody maybe dual licensed so that they could be doing both roles to, to just again to be able to contribute to that sustainability to be able to attract um and and keep teachers um within the district you know with a more robust you know close to as full-time teaching position as they can get so just curious if that if those are both going to be possible within this kind of newer variation of how to how to put the budget together thank you yeah, and, and I would uh, directly answer that is we try uh, whenever possible to have a full time position that we're hiring for. So if we do have the ability to share somebody across buildings or um, certainly people who are uh, have multiple licenses are, are wonderful to have because you can utilize them in multiple ways. And so we do look for that wherever possible, because um, we do know that part time positions for people tend to be the hardest to fill. And um, and so when we have these fewer FTEs, we're trying to make those into full positions whenever possible. OK, those are all our hands, both in the public and 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 here so uh, i'm i'm going to give everybody like just like 5 minutes because i'm here for some people that we've been sitting for a long time so we'll just give 5 minute break to use the bathroom and we'll come back and just try to be as efficient as possible to finish the rest of our agenda so we're going to move it really quickly i know that board members really want to start asking questions but we are going to move super quickly through the reports and we might skip two of the reports in order to but most importantly uh, let's do the student uh, sorry let's do the superintendent call report we just want to highlight a couple of things yep. and then we'll do the principal report yeah in the cold report just want to highlight that uh, we're starting to make some changes to our website and trying to update it and get some things going so we put in a little note uh to the board to tell you about some of the things that we're doing um we're going to continue just to keep give you regular updates as to what's happening to the website and get that out to the community as well um so we have those and we wanted to highlight one other piece that we don't typically talk about much and so julia is there um to provide that We just wanted to share with the board and the community that on Monday, November 11th, um, the morning was spent providing professional development to our paraeducator staff here at U32. Cat uh, provided, Cat Fair provided a warm welcome, and um, Jamie Spector, our school social worker from the high school, um, provided a trauma informed care workshop um, where the focus was on helping our paraeducator staff understand how trauma can manifest in students' behaviors such as withdrawal, aggression, and difficulty focusing. Um, she also emphasized the importance of creating a safe, supportive, and responsive environment for students who have been affected by trauma. Kathy Murphy Moriarty was here from um, the Employee Assistance Program, oh, supporting our paraeducator staff and providing them with the resources that are available through EAP for their own well-being and self-care. And then our final session was with our school psychologists, Sarah McLeod and Lauren Kiesling, who provided our paraeducator staff with strategies for supporting students who are facing challenges with executive functioning skills, such as attention, organization, and self-regulation. They discussed evidence-based interventions designed to help students with learning differences, ADHD, and other developmental needs to improve their executive functioning. Okay. And just to be clear, that was all pairs uh, throughout the district met here at U32. It wasn't just the U32 pairs. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> and are there any questions for our superintendent on the cult report? Or Okay, seeing none, we're going to move into the principal's report, and we have a couple of people also highlighting. Yeah, we want to highlight a couple of things from that. So, Jared, we wanted to highlight... Uh, well-being. Yeah, well-being. Being. Which... Um, Thank you. Thing. So one thing at Callus we've been working a lot on is community and just building that that Callus community with the students. And what we did during Halloween week, we did a couple of things. Um, one, we played a school-wide game of Clue. So every day I would get on the um, intercom in the morning and a staff member would come in playing a part. 
um, Rodsworth, the nighttime butler, um, <laughs> Professor Plum, or Professor whoever they are, Mrs. White, right? All of them. And the teachers would come in, staff would come in, and they would do voices, and we would sit there and act this out. It was like a 1940s radio show. And there's speakers on the outside of the building. And I think that. I think people could hear. <laughs> um, and so every day at the end of school, too, there would be parents I knew outside listening, trying to figure it out. Um, so what it was was just riddles and clues throughout the week. Sometimes they were riddles that we told them. Sometimes they were things put around the school and um, kids would be going around. They, would, they were seeing clues where there were no clues. They were seeing all kinds of things. And it was a lot of fun because one of the things with it is teamwork. We know that like in our pre-K kindergarten class or in our, our one one, you know, first grade class, they weren't necessarily fully understanding riddles, but the teachers would get them together and they would work out trying to figure out the riddles. Um, and it was just a lot of fun. And instead of having winners, what we did is for our PBIS, they would get gems for participating each time, which then got them at the end of the week to a uh, PBIS all school reward. Um, and so it went, it went really well. The kids really liked it. We even had a parent ask us to record one of them. So we record, I don't know where that is, but there is a recording of it. Um, and it was a lot of fun. They asked us if we're going to do it again. And I said, we'll see. Uh, <laughs> it was a lot. It was, it was, it echoed through the hills of Calus. Um, we also, during that week, we did, we ended up do, doing a Halloween parade. Um, and I wanted to do that because um, it's a good time to teach about things. So teachers in classrooms talked about you know, being appropriate with costumes and those things. I sent out an email to parents saying like, talk to your kids about this, like be mindful of these things. I don't like to hide from things. I like to use them as teaching moments. And I think we tried to do that as a school. And so then it was a lot of fun. All the kids all dressed up and they walk around the school. Parents showed up in costume to, <laughs> to watch as part of it. There's a certain head football coach that was Mr. Incredible. So if you want to, you want to see that full, full outfit, it was great. Um, and one of the things we did with that when it comes to in inclusivity and well-being was we had a costume swap. So we put a, a clothing rack outside so that parents could donate. I donated a whole bunch of costumes. The kids just don't fit anymore. And then parents could come up, put it, and they were just taking costumes and putting them. And it was just a really nice way to do that. There's like a no pressure if you need a costume, come take a costume. It's also one of those, why am I going to buy this for you to wear it once? Here it is. And so parents really appreciated that. So a lot of stuff going on. And then the final thing we did was um, on Friday, the first day of the Day of the Dead, we have a staff member whose family has celebrated that uh, before. And so she helped us talk about that with kids. Again, another part of just a a, a good cultural awareness of things that go on. And then we had a, a spooky sensory walk where we boxes covered with things in them, wet spaghetti, peeled grapes, warm mashed potatoes. And the kid's job was to come by and not look and put their hands in it and try to figure out what they were, what they were, what they were feeling in that bowl. Their, um, their answers to that. I should have made a tiny mic interview. I'm just going to be honest. Um, so it was just a lot of fun, a lot of just community building throughout the week. It took a lot, it took a lot of effort, but we really enjoyed it. I think the kids really enjoyed it. So Hopefully we'll do something like that again in the future. Thank you, Jared. Thank you, Jared. All right, and we also wanted to highlight some curriculum work at uh, East Montpelier. This is gonna feel really dry after what you just heard. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, any of you who have been on the board for a long time know that we have a data wall at East Montpelier. We've had it for well over a decade. Our teachers really live in that data wall. Um, and we each you know, time we do, some assessments of our students, we take a look at it and we follow a data protocol and it basically asks the same questions of our teachers every time. What do you notice? Any surprises, any celebrations, anything that's validating to you? Um, and then we talk about what does this mean for instruction? What does it mean for layer two, three, and four? And we bring our interventionists and special educators to the table and really look at um, how to use the data that we have to make the most meaningful um, intervention groupings, individuals, um, supports to students, and we continue to monitor that progress. And one thing that we added to the data wall this year that I feel really good about um, is that we, as a whole district, our elementary schools are looking at 
um, progress monitoring on a quarterly basis and working with our um, instructional coach around that. And so our data wall now has the data, like did this student receive a layer two invent intervention and for how long? <laughs> and you know maybe they ended up moving to a layer three intervention and for how long did they have that? So that we can start tracking a little bit more formally and systematized how we're providing interventions to students. Um, and it, it's been good, it's been a nice addition. The other thing I'll just share really quickly is um, another area that we started focusing on, and I talked to you about this last year, was writing. And we do all school writing prompts. Um, and this year, the, the thing that we've added to that, we try to improve upon our practice every year, um, is doing whole school read-alouds and then adding the writing prompt into it. Um, and we've been looking at using rubric that Curriculum Council over the summer created on writing and how to um, really look more closely and vertically at our student writing in grades K through six and add those pieces to our data wall as well. Thank you, Alicia. Sorry. Yeah. Um, what have you noticed um, in terms of the benefit of the data wall? So much, I don't what even know. <laughs> no, <laughs> and and um, do other schools have data walls as well, or is it unique to you thirty uh, to each one per? It is unique to us, and I am excited to share that. Um, other schools probably have other versions of it. This is one that we created um, years ago. Our teachers met with Ellen Dorsey, our coach, earlier today just to talk about how, um, so we we actually can look over like the last 10 years, I could pull up any of those, any data on a student going back 10 years. We use a traffic lighting system for those of you who are familiar with it, right? Red, yellow, green, and blue. Um, and it's just a way to house everything. Infinite Campus can do some of this, but it does not do everything that our data wall allows us to do. Um, so we look at writing, reading, math, social, emotional, nurse visits, we um, office discipline referrals, absenteeism. Um, so we have, there are many, many tabs for every grade level. Um, and the benefits are, is that it is like your one-stop shop if you want to look at a child over time. The other thing that we added Sorry, Stephen, we said we were going to be quick. Good. No, <laughs> um, the other thing that we added is we have student summaries. And so every year our classroom teachers put like just a few sentence blurbs about each student, a summation of their year. Some of those might be big events, right? They had something big happen in their lives. Some of them might be exited from an IEP or was put on an EST plan or whatever. And we can go back and look over time and say, oh yes, that was in second grade when that thing happened. Um, it's pretty locked tight. It's not open or available to anyone except for those teachers who have the students, but it's just, it's the warehouse where we hold all of our information. So is it shared with the families of the students? All of the data that is in that data wall is shared with the families in different ways, right? Through report cards, through the assessment results, through their attendance data and all of that. So they have access to all of it, but that data wall itself is not shared with families. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Alicia. Thank you. Yeah, Jared. thank you. That's awesome. Yeah, okay, so now we're gonna move student into report. the student report. You've been waiting a long time. <laughs> so go ahead. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, so unfortunately, Linnea couldn't join us tonight, but so I guess it's me. Um, <laughs> so some of you may have heard that uh, la this past Friday, there was an incident down at the bottom of Gallison Hill Road. Uh, and I, we would just like to relay the message that there was no imminent threat to U32 and there's no risk to the safety of students and staff. Um, and if, you're, if your student needs any help, we encourage them to make an appointment with their school counselor to talk about that. And also due to the investigation, information's kind of vague in some cases. Um, on a better note, uh, last Friday, the 8th, we at U32 hosted our first word of mouth event where 
young aspiring artists got to perform their original songs and poems over there in the atrium in front of the whole high school. Uh, that was nice. Uh, parent-teacher conferences occurred uh, last Monday, the 11th on Veterans Day. Uh, that was the first semester conferences. And there's a note from an email out from the library of U32. Uh, since the beginning of the school year, the U32 library has checked over three checked out over 3,000 books uh, with an average cost of $20 per book. That's an estimated $60,000 in savings for students. Um, the library hosts a lot of different clubs and events every week including Maker Monday and so Seeking Social Justice on Mondays. Um, a high school and a middle school book club, uh, plus Jam and Jam Junior, which I just learned meant like something with um, manga, I think it is, like a Japanese thing. I don't remember fully. <laughs> uh, that's on Fridays as well. Um, and then you can also find the U32 library at U32 library on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Uh, if you, there's a note from the Family of Color Affinity Group. Uh, if you want more information on that, you can head to securesmore.com to read that message. Uh, yesterday they had a meeting. That meeting focused, it, focused on curriculum and the response to a hatred protocol. So their protocol for when hatred occurs, which is actively being developed. Uh, on Saturday, last Saturday, Calus Elementary hosted a hands-on CPR learning course and hosted a bingo night for the U32 French trip. Uh, sports, uh, winter sports are soon to begin. We're super excited, super excited to see what is to come from our athletes, especially here at U32. Uh, the breaks, uh, so this, this coming week is Thanksgiving break with a total of nine days off from school. And after that, we will be back for just three weeks before heading to Christmas break. Uh, and then a few other things is theater. The play is, Hades Town? Hades Town. Yep. Hades Town, something like that. Yeah. Uh, uh, right now, they're working with Montpelier High School and their performing arts over there. Uh, performances are slated to be in January. And tomorrow, there is the Winooski Valley Music Festival at, I wrote that wrong, uh, at Harwood Union High School. And yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that report. Any questions for our student? Thank you for the report and for staying with us. Hey, I'm going to just make an executive decision. We're not going to do the Center of Our Career Center. Jody's going to be with us at our next meeting. Hey, the Vermont School Versus Association will do board learning at our next meeting. So we'll just, if the board is okay with that, so that we can move into board operations. Is that okay? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So board operations, budget draft one, your questions. Well, hearing none. Hearing um, none. <laughs> Let's move right into mailing ballots. Give it a shot. Okay. So great appreciation for this, for the layout and for the presentation. Um, the, the information going through it was very, um, very clear. Um, and I would just say that, you know, as we work toward that communicating transparently, having information transparently, that to me is why I uh, need the information of where the uh, suggested cuts are and that not trying to micromanage it, but it's information that helps me understand impact, 
<clears throat> excuse me. And when people come to me, if the community comes to me, I don't want to be informed by the community. I need to be informed by okay. by the work. So I would appreciate that part of it. But the layout, uh, I I really appreciate all the work that has gone into this and the detail that's in here. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, sure. You want I could tell questions? that you want to. Why did you look like you wanted to just go on? Okay. Um, no, I was just looking for pants and you looked like you were right. about to raise your hand. Okay. So go for it. So I'll go for it. Um, no, this, this is great and quite detailed, which I really appreciate. I do agree that um, at least seeing like a, a number of the elementary school teachers would mention like this is an increase, this is a decrease from last year. We didn't get that as much, I don't think, for the U32 one. But at least seeing that piece in writing, so we know that um, I don't, you know, I can understand specific cuts are a little bit more complicated. But at least seeing kind of where we're going up, where we're going down would be helpful. Um, I just to point the FTE calculations for the administrative assistants look wrong or like where it's a 0.2, it looks like it's actually a 0.7 based on days, unless their days are shorter on some of the. Oh, schools. it's, it's like 0.2 over 180 day school year. I think I, we can be more clear about that. Okay. Yeah. Right. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. It looked like they worked 180 days, but we're only 0.2. Right. Yes. Yeah. No, right. Okay. Um, I think we can be more clear. Okay. Yeah. yeah. They would, I think what we were distinguishing there was year round versus school year mm -hmm. um, time period, but 0.2. And in some maybe. schools, it was like 1.0 was 260 and 1.0 yeah. was 210. Yeah. That was just confusing. So okay. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Be helpful. Yeah. Um, um, I would be curious, um, I guess I'd just be curious that the 0.6 nurse over five days, um, sounds like Gillian thinks that would be, that would cover what they need. I'm curious kind of just what that would look like hours wise, but I don't need that answer now. Um, and lastly, I had one other question. Oh, um, I know most of the schools, except for Doty, had a health teacher FTE at some point. Um, are the schools taking Doty's amazing model of using counseling and nursing now to teach health, or is there a health hidden somewhere in here? <laughs> We're going to need a microphone. So can I first offer that yes. for anything that we teach, we need a certified teacher to be able to do that. And so that does create some different scenarios with how we do it. Yeah, so Doty has, um, with the lack of having a certified teacher, it's um, sort of skated through um, <clears throat> and in an effort to get the content to the students, um, our school counselor crosswalked her curriculum with the health standards to ensure that both those things were being met uh, <clears throat> to get some of those important content areas covered. Health, honestly, is a bit of a tangled mess in terms of finding a certified teacher. And so um, <clears throat> the Doty Health, um, Doty really only needs 0.1 health person to deliver the health curriculum. And so um, we didn't break it out on the slide, but it was on the spreadsheet. So it is 0.1, but it's part of sort of a shared position. So if we have the certified teacher who's going to do it, then we'll figure out with the schools that the person is shared with, are we going to do a block of health instruction? Are we, you know, how are we going to deliver it? So the other four schools do still have a some amount of FTE as a health position. It's we all want to have there. an FTE of a health position. Yeah, I just didn't see it in any of the schools, so I was curious. If it yeah. was. Can, uh, I would just say it's included in the allied arts number, and okay. I, I've heard the feedback that we should break Perfect. that out, but that's where it is, and Doty has a point to health uh, in the budget. Cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and then in terms of the nursing hours, it would be like the sort of the middle of the day, the lunch recess, the times are the most bonks and bumps. Can I just follow up on that? I, 
And specifically for Rumney, it looked like the Allied Arts was all accounted for through PE, music, and art. Is the PE also health or? We do, I believe, have a point one health for next year. Um, this year, that position is unfilled. Um, I believe we do have that for next year. So I'll have to check um, that point one with Suzanne. Um, maybe the Allied Arts FTE is 1.1 at Rumney, but I'll check and just make sure. Thank you. I don't see any other hands, but I see Chris. Almost, oh, there, Patrick, go first. Thanks. I wanted to follow up on the question before the public comment um, about the uh, weighted average, the long-term ADM. And Stephen, your answer was that it, it's it's friendly, I think is the term you used. Yeah. Yeah, that's nice. Is, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> is, it, is it friendly in both directions or is it only friendly in, in um, uh, when, when the numbers get smaller? Um, so it's friendlier when the numbers get smaller, but it is a two-year average. So it okay. just tries to ease, it tries to level out any changes yep. in enrollment um, so that there's no large swing up or large swing down um, for this. And, and what you see is a school, the, the denominator when you do the student per pupil expenditure is that actual number of students. Yep. And so when that number changes in a small school, it changes that per pupil pretty quickly. Okay, thanks. That clears up. Yeah. Yeah, I'm curious about, um, we talked at our last meeting, I think we were in Worcester, um, about this process. And yes, one of the dilemmas that I asked about and you affirmed was in fact a dilemma, <laughs> was more like the challenge of, of this potentially creating more partial FTEs across our school. I'm curious how that has evolved. Is that less of a problem, more of a problem than expected. And like vis-a-vis -vis this year, how does this budget, how do we expect this budget to compare in terms of partial positions and people wearing more than one hat in a position? Because unlike NOAA, um, I find that to be a weakness of a system when we have people moving across from school to school, doing multiple tasks, but trying to plan while they're also driving and right and also if i find those positions i guess intuitively it makes sense to me that those positions are harder to fill and maybe there's you know lightning strikes at worcester but if we if we go to replace that person we have a lot more difficulty in the future yeah so um so one of the things that i i hear from the principals is that there's a lot of this is staying fairly similar to what it was um, in terms of their allied arts. I know that there were a few adjustments um, because of, uh, and I'm looking to Alicia, right? So some, some slight adjustments there. Um, I, I will tell you that our goal is not to have a bunch of uh, small FTEs spread across multiple schools, but the size of our schools is driving a lot of that right now. So what happens, and, and I want to be Fair, like these are not easy positions to both inhabit as a teacher, uh, and I want to be respectful of that. Um, but we also um, don't want to have people that aren't working with children. And so when we when we increase these positions, we don't necessarily have a need for them to be in front of students with those additional uh, times. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, so right now to meet the needs of our students. There are a lot of partial FTEs because of the size of our schools. When there's not a whole lot of classrooms in any one school, there's not a need for the planning periods. And so that's where you kind of run into where we are right now. And so we have three schools that are, are pretty small and two others that are, you know, getting close <laughs> to, to small. And so, yeah, it does create, I, I will say that it's one of the harder parts of our budgeting. Is, is determining what level of FTE um, preserves our programming and provides those teachers with a, a, a job that's manageable. And we're, we're at that point where it's not working as well as we would want it to work. I mean, to be fair. In what way? 
Um, so having a teacher that's at three schools is difficult. On it's it's very difficult for that teacher mm -hmm. um, to be able to move between three schools to meet those uh, the needs of our kids um, because they're they're driving for part of that time um, and they're they're having to run three different locations. Um, and so those those aren't our best options uh, for the teacher side of it. It meets the student needs in terms of the hours and the programming, but but there are some teacher needs that happen in there that are just not fulfilled. And also in the way that we have one returning elementary librarian, yeah. which I find incredibly problematic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, yeah. it's funny to in terms of having full time position. Chris, can you um, use the mic? Yeah, join sorry. Sorry. Um, Sharon. I know. <laughs> yeah. You're so, a 0.5 FT, and I'm a 0.5 FT. Use the mic. Right. In the so mic. We don't have to travel far. Okay. Yeah. Um, can I go? Yeah, you can, can ask you a question, and then Michelle, do you have a question? Yeah. yeah. I have some comments, yeah. But yeah. Um, Chris can go first. Yeah. No, I prefer to you. No. Oh, you were already talking no, to no, I don't oh want this age. Okay. Beauty before age. So go ahead. Just a, a couple of things. Um, you know, you put the operations and maintenance on for additional supports. I think food service should be on it as well. It's just, it's that way there people see everybody who's at the oh, school. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Right. Um, Gillian, you refer to your counselor all the time uh, as about behavior. So I think, so people aren't confused saying, oh, well, Jody has a 1.0 counselor. I, maybe it should be broken out of this much of it is school-wide support versus counseling, mm -hmm. right? Um, then people will understand it better. Did um, the district happen to look or consider, well, actually look, not just consider, but look at like costs for um, outsourcing food service instead of hiring a director, right? I, I don't know. It's I'm asking. More complicated than yeah. Yeah. We, We'll give you some information. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Yes, that option is something that is on the table, but not the preferred option at this time. And we don't have any information on what that looks like. Um, but the board has, um, I think it was the finance. The, the, finance, the, finance committee, the finance committee asked for it, but it's, it's not as simple as that too, because also we have contractual agreements with the union. So so we okay. are just in the expo, I, because I just want to be clear, I don't want something coming out of the meeting saying that we're ready. We are in exploratory mode and all the right. finance committee authorized was to look at it holistically, which I believe is why you're asking. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I am a little concerned and I know it's hard, but there's only 471 economically disadvantaged families. And that just seems really small. Mm -hmm. I know it's hard to get people to fill out the household income form but like there should have been a big push because that makes a ton of difference. There was a push for um, um, that. And actually our-, our uh, Use the microphone, sorry. Uh, the household income form, there was a push to get people to fill it out. Uh, we've got that number primarily comes from our direct cert list and it has not changed drastically from last year. Although the next update, I do think will uh, increase it more. So I'm hopeful that the LTW ADM will go up, not down. Any other questions, Michelle? Or are you? Yeah, okay. I'm, okay. Okay. I'm gonna yeah, let Chris go and then yeah, you're Jonathan. Yeah, okay. So um, I have 11 brothers and sisters. Congratulations. <laughs> and, well, they're not all mine. I mean, I'm really to them. <laughs> and my mother uh, developed an everyday quantity of staples that we all would get, but we all had the same quantity. But some of my brothers were much bigger than I, so they were always hungry um, because they got only this limited amount. And so that EQS didn't do so well for our, our family, at least some members of it. And um, I feel bad for the staffing to sit, come and present to us and say, oh, it doesn't meet the Q EQS, even though I don't think the EQS fits very well with our district because we're scattered. And I'm, my impression is that those are more concentrated student numbers um, as opposed to uh, broadly based student numbers or spread out student numbers. So I would hope that they're not so tied to the EQS um, in terms of trying to meet their needs that they're actually not meeting their needs. Because I think Again, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that those are more based on a concentrated student population, like in a building, like 
our great EQS here at, at uh, U32 versus you know the the elementary schools. And so I think it might be something of a disservice in not, and undermining or understating the, the actual need to rely on that type of uh, criteria, just as a that general matter. Would you like for me to address that? Sure. Great. So, um, so when we look I'm, at EQS, just, the, I'd rather have accurate information than my rambling. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll try to get there. Yeah. Um, so, so the EQS gives us kind of what would the basic, the layer one and two supports look like for our schools. Yeah. And, um, and then the additions to that, right? So where we know that there's additional needs of our students because of the long-term weighted average daily membership that tells us that we might have more student needs that bigger brother that you were talking about mm -hmm. that needs more food would show up as additional needs within that which means that we are provide additional funding to that school so that they could say here's the interventions the additional food that your brother needs is a part of that uh, discretionary uh, layers three through six that the principals have additional monies to say hey, I think a school counselor is needed um, more than 0.4 at our school to meet the needs of our students, or we need four interventionists instead of two interventionists because of the needs of our school. And so those EQS numbers give us a place to start, but that's not the cap that we placed on anybody. We, we said that in addition to that, are there additional needs that occur in your school where we need to increase some of those services? And so we're, we, I agree that it doesn't tell the whole story, but it gives us a place to start the story so that we can then move from there and say, okay, what else do we need in addition to this? And so that's how we looked at the budget this year. And that, I'm glad to hear that. It just sounded like some um, principals presenting felt bad about going away from the EQS. It's my, my impression. I was hoping that they didn't feel bad about it. Um, just, again, just a I'm, comment. I'm listening. My observation. We, we all felt very empowered to make our own. I can speak for myself. I felt very empowered in my own building to make choices for for what I felt was best, whether or not, like, I think one of the numbers was like a 0.5 principal or something, and I was like, that would be really funny. <laughs> like, like that's not going to work, right? So, so there are like. I, I, for myself, I felt very empowered. There was no like, oh, this, I mean, and we were able to have discussions with each other where we could say, I'm presenting this. My number is higher. These are the reasons for it. We had really great dialogue with each other in coming up with these. I, that, I felt, really but, good to hear. Yeah. Um, and, but um, were you empowered just within a certain budget amount that was allocated to the school? Yes, based yes. on the okay. yes. Okay. And so, I think it's important to note that the long term weighted average daily mem membership is a weighting system that is designed to think about how do we meet the needs of students on our, who have a range of learning needs. Right. And so I think coupling, thinking about EQS as like sometimes it's in our old thinking to think about equalized pupils, that the amount of funding was already weighted to be able to account for differences in need. Okay. Um, I, Rebecca, I, let me follow up with you just because you, I, I agree with you. You had a very nice presentation, um, but how, tell me, tell us more about uh, the thinking of doing things differently and what, what that would entail. And do you have any um, examples of sharing that, like of, of things that you think need to be done differently? So I would say a couple of things. One is that, um, like I said at the beginning, when we have something that is like, we all are feeling very far away. I'm gonna stand up and move. <laughs> it's not usually hard. Can, can I throw Good something things. in too as yeah. just a sec? So um, one of the other pieces is when we started the process, I was holding everybody to a 3% increase mm -hmm. in, and none of the schools ended up with a 3% increase. We increased that amount because we realized pretty quickly that wasn't going to meet our student needs. Right. And so they did start with a cap that yeah. got quickly removed. Okay. Yeah. So one thing that I think is important to note is that we are in November and we have a long time in the school year as we think about kind of upsetting and thinking about structures that help to create the kind of programmatic vision that we want. 
So I say all that to say, I am four months into that um, with no prior year to come in from. And what I'm noticing is that in some places, what has happened is where there might've been a mentality around cuts, what has happened is instead of kind of saying, we're cutting this position and now we're thinking about the work that people do as like, we're taking two positions and instead we're putting a slash between somebody's job title, right? You are now doing this and this, you're taking on a little bit more. And that actually isn't a sustainable model of moving forward, right? The sustainable model would be to say, if we really believe that we can do the work of relevant and rigorous instruction, and we can do the work of creating a space where people feel included and that students feel well-known, then we need to sort of like throw things up and say, how do we redistribute the work that's happening within a different structure? So we're not keeping the same structure. So a good example of that is like, when we think about kind of our office staff, instead mm -hmm. of putting slashes between, between a, in a job title, thinking about what is all the work that needs to be done operationally and how do we divide that among the people that we have? And I don't have a like perfect answer to that now because we are in November and I, we, I need more information. I need to be able to develop teams and think about what is our long-term sustainability. But I do see that as a possible place to say, where are the places where we are, we are actually like, there's a lot of work to be done and we're gonna do it with this many people. And now we're gonna create the system or structure that does that. Mm -hmm. As opposed to taking the system or structure we have and pushing things into the boxes that we already have. Does that kind of make sense? A little no, no, it, it, mm -hmm. and, and what would you think need, needed to be, would be the stepping stones toward that um, discussion? It's a, and it's a in-depth long one involving the, the entire school in the community. Okay, the that. elephant in the room. I understand. And so, but. Yeah. Um, so I think you've actually, like, I think Steven set you up well to do that, set me up well to do that at U32. And really it's about saying like, okay, so we've started some teaming structure. So we've started to thinking, think about how do we think about our seventh and eighth grade cores then asking the question, would that work if we, would that same structure work if we added more students or subtracted more students? And if the answer to that question is, we're not sure, then we need to sort of upend that and play with it differently. But that's really where we are is sort of, how do we assess and do a little bit of an audit of the structures that we have in place? We're running classes that only have one or two students in it then we need to ask ourselves, is that actually a sustainable model and is it good for kids? And if our answer is, well, that doesn't, in those three priorities that actually isn't satisfying that, then we start to upend that and just ask some more, more questions and then get to a place where we can say with, with some certainty that we have modified structures. But that work is ongoing programmatic work that we need to do within our school community and isn't the work of budget, except to say, when you let us know what a budget is, yeah. we will let you know how we're doing okay. that work. Okay. Thank you. Don't forget. Oh yeah, I just, I just, uh, Jonathan and then, uh, yeah. Yeah, this is just more a kind of a broader question. Um, are we concerned with the new change in the federal administration? Are we concerned about <laughs> possible reductions <laughs> in federal funding? And if so, um, I mean, I'm not saying we need a contingency plan or plan B, but maybe there ought to be some places where we may anticipate there might be serious reductions in certain areas, and that might require a reshuffling of the entire budget. I'm not sure. Well, I think one of the things that you saw in the budget was where are we spending our um, grant funds and where are those grant funds going right now? Um, I think also the question that we had gotten around um, kind of more of those categorical um, numbers that are in the revenue, I think making that clear so that we can make decisions about that. I, I would hesitate to start making decisions based upon what 
may or may not happen. Yeah. And and certainly, yeah, we're going to keep our eyes on what's the federal government going to do. But I think that our most important thing is what we can control right now. Um, and just making sure that we keep an awareness of where we're spending those federal dollars is an important part of what we do. Um, and then also just making sure that our programs are designed to be sustainable in the future. Now, whether or not that means that those federal funds are there or not, and, and you may have heard, uh, Jen is a good example, is we used to fund our instructional coach solely with federal funds, and those federal funds aren't sufficient to do that, yet we're committing to continuing that work. And so I think just keeping that in our the forefront of our work and making sure that we're keeping an eye on it is important. But right now, I wouldn't suggest us making any moves based on that. I think our state legislature in the next session is probably going to create more changes than the federal government will in long term. And so I think being a part of that discussion and keeping that um, in front of us is going to be more important. Daniel, and then Amelia. Well, I just had a, another question for Becca. You, um, in your presentation, you emphasized that that budget summary for U32 by staff positions did not reflect um, the, the work being done to, to create third spaces in co-curricular programming. And I wanna know how, how that can be reflected somehow. And yeah, like why did I'd I like bring it up? more about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that, again, one of the things that I've noticed is that there is a real culture around clubs and, and co-curriculars. And there's a, there's a stated kind of position at U32 that um, we don't talk about them as extracurriculars. We talk about co-curriculars. What happens outside the classroom is important. And much of that has moved into the school day using callback. But I do think there are opportunities and whether that's through additional grant funding um, or through partnership work um, to really think about how do we make this building active in lots of different ways in our after school time. And the reason that I bring it up is that if we are going to go to a place where sixth graders come into this building, it is going to be of utmost importance that our middle grades have after school programming that does not just reflect an athletics program, but that we have an after school programming that reflects um, the various needs of our youngest learners in this building. And so I bring it up to the board to say that that is not good. It's currently reflected in sort of small ways within our school day, but I think it's something to put on the, that I am thinking about is how do we make sure that athletics is not the only third space we're providing for young people or theater isn't the only third space we're providing for young people or the most, even the most important one that we have a little bit of an understanding that um, again, we put our, when we put our money where our mouths are, then that like, that really does say something. It tells a story. Right now, we put money in sports. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and just a just a comment to reinforce that. I think this this could be an area of growth if we stick with this model of budgeting. This school allocated resource section, like being a little bit more descriptive about mm -hmm. how like what those categories look like and how they reflect our strategic plan goals and our, our cultural goals for what we are trying to build as communities here. Thank you, Tim. Okay. Um, this is more of a comment, but I feel like the timing is appropriate. Um, I'm feeling extremely grateful for all the work that the administrators have put in, Suzanne, all the principals in your presentation. And this just feels like the epitome of resiliency and um, I really appreciate the creative cognitive reframing from a behavioral psychology perspective of like the coming together and the workshopping of, you know, how do we kind of get the morale up, but also just be really practical with what we have with all the constraints that we're faced with. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Ursula. So I have a statement and a question. Um, my statement's very similar to Amelia's. I heard our administrators get up and get to tell us how they were allocating their funds for their schools to meet their student needs um, because they know their student needs and what their schools need. And I really appreciated that. And I appreciate, appreciate the approach that we're taking to budgeting for that reason. 
I did have a question, kind of maybe two that go together. Our long-term weighted average daily membership is not a set in stone number yet. Do we feel that our budget has flexibility for that change? And I know Suzanne, you said you think it might go up, but if it went the other way, do we have flexibility? And then I think just a generic, do we have flexibility in our budgets with potential fluctuations? And I know we don't see huge ones, but there are some as we get closer to next year. Is there flexibility? When you say flexibility, are you talking about the excess spending threshold? Is that where you're at or? I guess flexibility, if a school were to see an influx of students, do they still feel they can meet their needs? Is it going to be a hardship? If a huge number of students left, would it cause, right? Like, I don't think we are going to see huge numbers of shifts, but we always see some number of changes as we get close to the beginning of the school year. Like, so next year, as we're approaching the start of the school year, kids move in, kids move out, but sometimes we see, and I think more importantly, we've had community members ask if, if there was an increase, is there capacity and flexibility? To accommodate them. I, I can take a little bit of that. So one thing to remember, and that was that kind of the hold harmless piece of this, is that next year were, is based upon this year and last year's numbers. And so if we saw a wild swing next year, it's tempered some. And I would also say, and this was something we had talked about at the previous um, session, was our fund balance is that one time if there was something big. And I think that that's what we want to just frame that as, is that that if we were to suddenly have an influx of kids and need another second grade class in a school, we didn't budget for that. But we would first look, can we do that within the budget that we have? And if we needed some additional funds for, for that short time period to get it into the longer term plan, that would be where I would recommend we might go to the fund balance. So the fund balance is there to try to take the shocks out of the system. Um, whereas the, the changes in the system are gonna be kind of evened out with the two year average. And so I, I think that's where I would recommend it. That means that we are, I mean, there's some things within the budget as you notice like capital we cut back. And, and so there are, are not as many places within the budget to, to go for extra funds. But I also think that we've budgeted responsibly. And if we were to have a shock to the system of, of needing like an extra teacher or something like that, we could look to the budget first and then the fund balance second. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I did have uh, one quick question kind of off of Becca's thing is, do we actually allocate funds towards third, spaces like is it actually like a notable thing besides like sports like besides sports do we have like a fund for third spaces and then also if if we do and with becca's emphasis on it how does she propose that we with the with the uh lack of ability of flexibility i guess for certain for other funds how does she or anyone else propose that we would be able to put money towards their spaces if right. that those costs were needed so i'll start with the first part which is there's a limited amount of funds that are dedicated to third space activities at this point in time most of our funds are designated towards athletics and towards some of our our big programs like a theater program um there are some funds that are designated towards like after the bell, but they're very small and that's mostly a middle school program. Yes, we need to build a long-term plan around what kind of third space activities do we want, not just at U32, but across the district as a whole. This is this goes to the questions that Daniel's been asking um, and that the board has been, um, been kind of nodding around as I'm saying this right now, is that we need to develop a better plan around what before and after school looks like within our school system as a whole. And what can we do there? We are not fully budgeted for that at this point in time, but I also think it's important for us to plan for it um, before we budget for it. Um, because I think there, Becca pointed out, and we've already talked about, there's some grants out there that are part of this that we might want to look at um, more, more so. Uh, and those grants are in a lot of different forms. So I'm gonna throw a word in here in the middle of all of this that everybody's been asking about, but community schools is one of those things that's a part of a broader range. So looking at community schools, 21st century grants, the Vermont after school program, there's a lot of different things. And having, I, I would, I'm gonna speak as a former principal for a second, 
adding in programming when um, we already have a full plate is a difficult thing to do. So planning for somebody to help do that work would be an important part of the, of the overall. And so that would be where we would look at grants to help us get started and then have a broader conversation in our communities about what we wanted and what we needed. Mm -hmm. And so that's a big answer to say, no, it's not in the budget as deeply as we would want, but it's certainly a top priority for us in the future. Thank you. Like, yeah. yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, and that should be in combination with community connections and you know, what oh, yeah. we do before and after school. So farm and to school program. And farm well. To, well, but, Wait, but farm I think, to school? Uh, that's new, Daniel. Yeah. But I think questions uh, for me, I, I have a couple of, you know, I'm incredibly grateful grateful for, like you said, Amelia, the resilience in the work that you all have put into the budget. Mm -hmm. You know, you basically have saved us in so many ways. But I also want to know what, what is our plan, right? Like we are going to have those configuration committee meetings and conversations separately. But we also were very firm at communities that we would, we had this conversation in our last meeting that said, you know, well, in two years, we're gonna potentially move the sixth graders, right? What, is, what does that look like? I also wanna be honest with the community too and say, you know, where are we duplicating services, for example? With, and what I mean by duplicating services is like, you know, we, we have small schools, you know, even if we consolidate, which I'm not talking about doing right now, we, it would still be a small school. So we are looking for funding for third spaces, right? We put just 50, I think it was, I can't remember right now, it was like $50,000 for community connections, right? That would be an investment that would be worth and that will we'll give us back so much in for student outcomes, right? That we are not using because we, you know, I'm not trying to confuse everyone, but I, I want us to be honest with each other that we are, moving the system, but we also made some pro some promises. So can we have a list of some things, like especially the sixth grader grade conversation is something that I, I would wanna know more. Yeah, um, I, I think um, I would identify a few areas that, it, it, cause, and this was, I think it goes back to a question that Chris had asked before is like, what else, right? What are we not seeing in our budget that we, we might want? Third space is certainly one that has really risen as part of some of our discussions. I would also say that instructional coaching is an area in which you notice there we have one instructional coach for the district. Instructional coaching is a uh, research proven way to improve layer one and two instruction, which is that first instruction that our students get that would be a, an area that we need to focus on um, in the future. One of the questions that we had a very difficult time answering throughout the configuration process was what do we get if we were to uh, reconfigure the district? We had a very difficult time bringing that into focus. I think this budget is a beginning of us starting to see where is that focus, right? So where are the things that we would gain if we talked about a different configuration within our district? And, and I don't wanna, I don't wanna get ahead of ourselves as to what that configuration is. Sixth grade is one of them that we brought up. Um, as a potential, but I think it's important for us now to talk about, okay, if we reconfigure, we would be able to create more third space opportunities. Uh, we would have, be able to have instructional coaches as part of our work. We would be able to have fewer uh, broken uh, FTEs, you know, those multiple FTEs across the district. We can start to identify those things a little bit better now that we've gotten into this budget process. And I think those are the things to bring to the configuration committee, along with what are our long-term projections for our enrollments within our schools. Which are, which are important factors for us to consider and how we're gonna deliver those services um, that we want for all of our kids. So the other side of that point is what can we do without that we're currently doing? I mean, Rebecca brought up a, yeah. I, I think an example, I don't know if it's a real one, but a, a, at least a hypothetical, one or two students in a class. Um, and and that's, so what can we do without? Because if you, you're not funding things that are not worthwhile anymore, uh, then that creates funding for other things that um, uh, an evolution of what we are providing. Agreed. Essentially. Agreed. So um, I have a couple more questions. Okay. And I just want us Quickly. to be conscious I, about the time too, because we still have the rest of the entire packet mm -hmm. from um, us. So. so in the transportation, does that include uh, an extra route for Doty? No. Okay, it, so it, the transportation is not set yet for next year. So I, I don't want to say that there's no, but uh, we don't know what our ridership is going to look like yet 
for our entire district, which is what this is shaped upon our contract and what we expect there to be in terms of transportation. But it could also mean the reduction of a route somewhere else as well because of ridership. We've, just because that's been an issue we've been talking about. And, and can I, just Gillian, I, as I understand it though, we were able to redo that route that's out there. Just so we can clarify, because there have been some changes to it. I, well, so there are two separate issues. First is this year's route, which is slightly different, which has impacted the rides. Um, so some students on the Callis Road side have long rides both to and from school. Uh, so in order, what I did was I surveyed families um, about the rides. And because it's mid-year about whether or not we'd be able to flip some things around for the routes this year. Mm -hmm. So the, um, what the upshot of that was is that it would actually sort of create some more hardship for families at this point because of childcare arrangements that they made based on the timings mm -hmm. of the routes from August. So the routes for this year are staying the same but as Stephen said, it, it sort of depends. It all depends on where the kids live because um, particularly in Worcester, Worcester is a spider. So Dodie is in the body of the spider and all the roads um, are the legs. And so a bus can't, you know, a bus in, in Middlesex can make a loop. Uh, a Worcester bus goes, and it depends, sorry, <laughs> side effect, sound effects, it's after nine, it's past my bedtime. Uh, <laughs> so it sort of depends, honestly, where the students live, more so in, in um, Worcester than it does other places. What I can say about the Worcester route is that the bus coordinator over at First Student and I have known each other for a really long time and have a really good relationship and kind of figuring out and talking about busing. And as Stephen said, for example, um, you know, if it it's, I think the most dramatic in Worcester, but I'm sure for the other communities too, in terms of where students are living, perhaps, you know, I'm just gonna pick on Middlesex because I live there, so I feel like I can. Um, if the Rumney, where Rumney students live changes in terms of how the bus routes work, then can it be that sort of a bus route, you know, money and bus time or whatever that's been allocated towards Middlesex students, can that be transferred over to Worcester students? But it really depends on where they all are. Yeah. Can I, can I just offer, I think one of the things that would be important is just in the same way that we've developed a framework around how we're allocating um, teachers to, uh, you know, kind of the EQS piece as, as our start, I think it would behoove us to bring the transportation committee together to talk about some of these pieces as well, to develop our framework. Because there's also uh, how many students per bus are we looking at as, as being a viable bus route for our communities? Um, because we are, it's not just the Doty bus, but we have a couple of other buses out there that have a pretty low ridership. And so we may, we may want to balance it. It's the same like the class of three, yeah. um, a bus of 10, is that, um, is that below our threshold? And then we talk about how we, we might have longer ride times, but we have more kids on a bus, which can save us money, which could push money over to the classroom side. And so th but these are all the trade-offs, right? Yeah. They're trade-offs. And I think that the transportation committee developing a framework for that would be a really good place for us to start prior to whether or not we want to renegotiate or- Is that a year? Uh, yeah, that's next year. Okay. Yeah. Um, one more okay. um, question. And it seems like the um, board budget is going up uh, by 23.5. Can you use the mic, Chris? Yeah, I'm sorry. The board budget is going up by 23.54%. This case, nine of these is a numbers part. Uh, and that it seems that it's tied primarily to an increase in purchase professional and technical services. Um, it looks like at least I'm reading, it looks like it's going up almost $77,000. If that's, if I'm reading it accurately, I'm wondering why. So that I would that's, have to ask Suzanne. It's based on, it's based on actuals that the board has actually utilized professional services at that level in the past years. On, on an average? 
That much or just this past year? This past year and the current year that we're in. Okay. That's the um, level that you're utilizing professional services at. So maybe we should have a discussion about whether we think we'll utilize that much again okay. in the future, just to pair that back. Yeah. I mean, just because we may be, I think it seems like we use more of these past couple of years than we have but it's, traditionally. Well, why don't we, we that's yeah, a conversation I think we could have. have. Yeah. yeah, Daniel and then. Uh, yeah, I just had a, a specific question. I'm curious if Jared could address how Callis is served by 0.2 FTEs and a school nurse. You ask me that now as I have to be the nurse right now. We don't have a nurse. Um, we don't have some of the medical needs that some of the other schools have. We have a lot of tummy aches and not feeling well, and it takes up a lot of time, but it's not a lot of high need. Um, and if I have to choose right now between making sure that, that students have the interventionists that they need and the nursing, that is where I just made that decision. Um, considering we also just don't have great need um, right now. Is having a nurse in there more? a benefit absolutely but when balancing things out if i have to find a place where i can make it work that's that's one of them if we had serious medical needs and especially the way that it's that we've been budgeting this there would be other ways to find more for that um, and to do that but right now that's that's the the number that that we've come up with because i think we can we can service it as it is right now that's one full day a week it's one full day a week or depending on how, if we do with anybody else, it could be a half day each, to, you know, right now, if somebody's just there during right before lunch and right after lunch, my life would get a lot easier, right? Like it's, it's times of the day when those things happen. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's, it would be one full day, but it would depend on how we make it work with other schools. Okay. Can I ask a follow-up question on that? Mm -hmm. Does, do you have sufficient access to nursing or medical services if an emergency came up and how would you? Yes, right now I've actually called the Rumney nurse a couple of times this week and she's been a great help. Um, and just to, cause there, there's a difference between band-aids and tummy aches and, oh look, a rash yeah. that I have no idea, right? And we've been able to call and, and get that help that we need. Um, and we even have a couple of parents who have offered that our nurses to possibly fill in when they could. Um, and so we, we have ways to make it, we have ways to make it work, but yes, we have had access when we've needed it. Is there sufficient video contact so that if like a rash you can describe it, but having a professional look at it, is there sufficient, is that available as an option? We haven't really implemented uh, uh, virtual oh, nursing think, yeah. at this point in time. I would also say this is an area where we're looking at other models because there are other models of nursing that include um, a nurse. I, I'm forgetting. Telemedicine. But not the oh, telemedicine. Right. I'm sorry. I'm, there you go. Yes. The school nurse leadership model, which would have uh, LNAs as opposed to RNs. And so what we know we brought that up. So that's something we're looking into as well as to what are the longer term pieces that we can do with that. And so... It, we don't know if it's a cost savings or not, um, but it certainly could provide different services. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. I'm going to try to hover us through the last few items on our agenda. Can I say yeah. thank you to the principals and dismiss oh, them yeah. at this point in yeah. time? Yes. yes. Thank, okay. you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much. Can I, can I ask you guys for a favor? When you go out, I think Norm is being a little discreet and doesn't want to come in. Would you mind just telling him he can come in? Pick up. Yes, thank you. Because I have to wait. Okay, so let's let's move on into. Um, I'm going to put it all together. Mail in ballots. Uh, Can I just ask one quick question as to next steps around this budget? So, um, lots of notes. Yes, and, and uh, then you will. Uh, so then, at our next the community meeting, well, we'll, we'll give. Excuse me. We'll give some updates to a few of the simple things so yeah. that you have those numbers for us. And then uh, draft two, um, we'll refine some of this, make sure that the numbers are, are you know more precise because we'll be after our December 1st uh, letter at that point in time. So we'll be able to start just a little more specific, but getting the board some, I've got several notes here of things. 
like breaking out the allied arts and providing um, the information about cuts and all of that. We'll try to get those out even prior to the next meeting. And if we have questions that pop up, like as we're looking through, just email you. That would be great. And, yeah. uh, and myself and or Suzanne, um, so that we can um, make sure that we clarify. There were some great, you know, great things in here. Remember, this is the first time we're doing it this way. So mm -hmm. those clarifying yeah. comments are really helpful. And we're posting a, a survey at the end of the meeting. The survey is already posted on the website mm -hmm. and posted online. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, let me risk one more question, um, Stephen. Yeah. Would a six percent make a measurable difference? I'm sorry. Say Would a six percent increase make a measurable difference? Um. So well, every it's measurable, but significantly measurable difference. I don't think so. Okay. I mean, to be, it's only it's only not even two hundred thousand yeah. dollars, right? So, uh, and distributed across the system, it's not going to make a, a huge difference in anything that we do. And I would I would also offer that our increase that we are showing right now it seems to be very reasonable. You know, I would always hope that it was a little bit lower, um, but this is a, a pretty reasonable increase. And I think we can talk about the fact that our expenditures only went up by 3.5%, which I think is really a testament to the hard work of this team. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So now I'm for real gonna close that conversation because we need to get you guys home too. So mail-in ballots, there was an attached letter. There's no action that you need to make with that i just wanted you to be aware the action we make is that once we get everybody to have their meetings but what i do need is volunteers so i'm just making some uh, assumptions so for callas is it you or michelle daniel or elizabeth if i need a volunteer to go to the select board meeting yeah you can really okay so <laughs> daniel daniel is callous i'm not in any particular order here berlin is it you diane or is it jonathan i can go or oh, keely. Oh, keely. Keely. okay you're a keely. saint keely i love you thank you keely. <laughs> uh, okay uh, middle sex is i'm happy to go okay chris and then uh, I need Wooster. Uh, it's just hiding. <laughs> okay, I'm a, I'm appointing Julia. Oh. This is not, okay. Now uh, uh, East East Montpelier. Uh, I, I can do it. Okay, thank I'm on you. The agenda for the second, anyways. Oh, great. So Sack is going so I, I'll be sending this letter out to everybody to all of the select boards today and then uh, adding it to their first meeting in December and, so and, and I would like to try to join you if possible at those meetings so um, I'll, I'll just communicate with you as well okay. if I can okay. so then the next uh, the next part of that is that as as you know some of you, the list was not completely complete the first time it, we put it there. But if you need to uh, have some blanks here, so you know who you are, Patrick, uh, Jonathan, Ursula, uh, myself, uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, and uh, yeah, let me see, my thing just moved. My, iPad is being is had it for the day. Yeah. yeah. So those of you who are running or were appointed. so Julia, Ursula, and Michelle, Jonathan, and uh, Patrick, and Elizabeth. Yeah. Okay. So then we have a district clerk opening. Might be that I found somebody today. It's not for sure. So if you have any ideas, please talk to somebody. We were going to be posting this. Uh, Melissa is not going to be able to do it next year. She would do it uh, through March. Yeah, but we need a we need a district clerk. So whoever is on the call right now that might be willing to be a district clerk, please contact Melissa or or myself. Um, and we'll be posting that on Front Porch Forum. And we'll be posting that in Front Porch Forum and on the website and in, in uh, Facebook and all of the media uh, that we can. Okay. Uh, with that, uh, I think what is the 
sorry, keep going back and forth in my agenda. So now is the configuration. Uh, I was going to jump us, and I almost forgot the configuration committee. Mm -hmm. So there, we included a draft memo in the, for the configuration committee that hopefully you guys had a chance uh, to to review. Uh, and the way that you know wanted to frame this conversation is that we looked at uh, a possible charge read it out loud or I don't know if you guys have had a chance to look at it. So the Confederation Committee shall study Washington Central and Five Union School District Education System and make recommendations to ensure all students are afforded quality education opportunities <coughs> in an efficient, sustainable and equitable education system that would enable students to achieve Daniel wanna pick up <coughs> Okay. That will enable so, students to achieve the highest academic outcomes. The committee shall make advisory recommendations <laughs> to the Washington Central yeah, School good. Board for configuration changes necessary to make Washington Central strategic plan goals a reality. The configuration committee will engage in a design protocol to generate ideas about how our schools could be, could be structured to maximize student opportunity in our enrollment realities. And composition of the committee would be three officers and two additional board members, uh, five community members, one from each town and three administrators, a high school principal and now the high school principal <laughs> and elementary principal and the superintendent. Thank you, Daniel. So, it, you know, we took into consideration, so Ursula, Daniel, myself, Matt, we took into consideration all of your input and that's how that charge, I think is pretty clear. It, so if everybody's okay with that, we would we would post to request people to wanna to wanna join. We what we did not have time yet is to create a criteria of how we would be picking uh, those people. But we will, you know, we it, it's an urgent for us to have a form committee. So we would be posting with this charge. Uh, so there were several things that we wanted to talk uh, through, and I feel like tonight we might not make justice. <laughs> To the whole to the whole piece but at least if we can agree on on composition the the administrators are already what we have right now we already have Stephen and uh, Alicia and uh, Becca are are part of uh, are part of that and then we would have to if we appointed the three officers we would need two from other towns so we would have Middlesex already represented we would have Berlin what are officers the so the chair, 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 chair and the clerk. clerk of the committee of the of no, the board. board that's of the board of the board the board's I, uh, chair. I don't understand why it would be those three officers because we already represent different communities. But are you but asking why, why it should be you? I mean, why is it yeah, why officers I'm, so opposed to you know, part board of the members <laughs> as a whole? <laughs> I, I think we can do it the pleasure of the board. What we were trying to simplify it is that a lot of the time there's things that need to be discussed at the steering committee, and then there would be people from the steering committee already, but if we just said the steering committee, that is extra work for the steering committee. So it, it's <clears throat> whatever. So if if I, I wouldn't want to change it members. just for one person, but but so then let's appoint them. The, I, the idea was that then we would be appointing two people tonight as opposed to five people tonight. But Daniel, I just think I I don't feel strongly about it. I think one thing one goal of ours was to reduce the number of board members regularly attending, just because acknowledging that we're going to have five community members, it's they're going to be more challenging meetings to get through an agenda. And so we're reducing the number of board members. And that I feel more strongly about because I think it's important for efficacy of the meetings. And with that is also the importance of reporting regularly out to the full board. So the full board is aware of the work and trusts the work of the committee. Officers are board members. Yeah, right? again, I don't feel strongly about the officer, the officer piece. Um, so the other, just, just the other thing I want to uh, just comment on um, is making advisory recommendations to the to the um, board as a whole, um, because I don't think that worked out very well uh, going through the, the last round, because I think the recommendations came as a almost fate accomplished, accompli, uh, which is hard to bring the whole board in and discuss. So I think having some type of informative 
this is what we're thinking about. What do you think along the way, as opposed to at the end, um, would, would be a more inclusive and way to go? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Daniel start, and then you can go, because That's we fine. discussed it. So Yeah, so it, if you go down to the final must-dos of yeah. the memo, there's a little bit more specificity about that. We, we say that reports to the board can either be explicit recommendations or they can be merely findings. You know, we can we can task ourselves or the board can task us with something more specific, like, you know, the feasibility of extending the community school model, hypothetically, or something like that. It can be just findings of something's feasibility or practicability, or it can be something broader, like, you know, how would we how would we transition to fewer than five elementary schools? So we gave ourselves the flexibility to do both things and also more than one thing at a time because the, like the merger with other school districts shouldn't be put on the back burner, but it also can't, it also can't take over the entire agenda and we need to be able to do both things or more than one thing at once. And hopefully this reflects that. We did our best to get it all into the document. So hold on, Chris. Uh, Ursula. I was also gonna point out that in the must do's, not just the final must do's, but the must do's, one of the points is to develop a work plan. So the committee would be required to develop a work plan um, of the committee work and full board involvement. So they're gonna be looking at how do they schedule reports to the board so that the full board can hear what's been going on in the committee and report back and ask questions, not report back, but ask questions and maybe even provide guidance to that committee. Um, I think we, we want findings sounds better than recommendations to me, um, as opposed, because recommendation has a weight to it. Um, I think that um, it, it is hard to get away from. To be quite honest, I think the, when you say this is our recommendation and we've already thought about it, as opposed to the board making their own, uh, if these are fact findings, and what do you think mm -hmm. we should do? But um, that's why we call that advisory, Chris, because at the end, the, the weight of this decision is going to be on the board. We're the elected officials to make the final decision. So that's the, it's, it's advisory, but it includes all of us. They're not going to be making the decision for us, right? No, I know. I okay, so, so I think we're all talking the same thing. The, but the wording matters um, because you say, well, charge said to make recommendations. As advisory to, recommendations. Well, even if it's advisory, it's a it, recommendation for a particular course um, of action. Good feedback. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, I have a question. Um, we had talked, well, it had been floated out there as an idea of engaging an external third party person. Would that be part of this work? Would it be something the committee would consider? Um, or where does that stand in the conversation? I just wanted to ask a clarifying question. You're talking when we had community members that asked that we bring in an impartial third party. We had a group. board member who asked. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I think we, we would be bringing experts as, as needed. It, Ginny Phillips is gonna continue to help us as a facilitator through this. She's helping us both as the board and with this of how do we tie both things together. But obviously our administrators are also gonna be busy. What we are gonna to try to do is gather all of that information. But if we need it to bring, if what the configuration committee needs is, I don't know, I'm just throwing a name, Mike DeWees to come back and tell us, you know, what he told us in 2014 or whatever, or put it all together, we will do that. But we, at this point, we don't wanna be prescriptive of mm -hmm. that to the configuration, configuration committee. And, and we are talking really seriously about having uh, a, the community schools be part of the conversation as a whole. And it's listed as holistic for the district. So that might kind of take care of part of that. Mm. Not completely, but <laughs> okay. Uh, so we would need to point, uh, is anybody else before Chris, Michaela, anything that you wanna add or you're okay with the charges that it's? Okay, if I'm just looking down the line, Patrick, Michelle, Zach, Jonathan. Okay, so could we just, to get it done, just point some people or do you wanna wait until our meeting on Wednesday and for now we just appoint our next meeting and for now we just send invite 
uh, people to send their well, applications. I think before we send so, invitations, we should set out the criteria of how we're going to make selections, just so that they know. Can I make a suggestion? You're talking about yes. community members. Or yeah, we should talk about community, community members. members. Yeah. And, I, yeah, and I was doing that on Little Reapers, but go ahead, Daniel. I was just going to ask if we could um, task the steering committee with developing the like a quest questionnaire and like a rubric for choosing community members and and then based on on what interest we receive from community members maybe we adjust our appointees our board appointees to the committee mm. and we and we not rush into board appointees first. okay okay yeah that makes sense yeah. And then, so, but then do we wait to ask for community members too until we have their rubrics? Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I just, I just feel like we should ask for community members as soon as possible, even yeah. without having the criteria quite yet, because then we would be selecting for members yeah. and community members because mm -hmm. we can't really wait for, yeah. otherwise, we won't have people. For and it. we need to give people time. Especially given that we're coming into the holidays, we want to give people time to write their little like, interest. Yeah, their interest letter to us that they're interested in why and what they bring to the committee. So we're going to put a deadline for we want to create this committee by this point in time and then just give them a deadline for work. So that is the last part of so, the conversation. And yeah. But tonight. I also, do, have we listed on here or thought about what is the time commitment we're asking people? So, Just so, so that's the last piece of the conversation okay. today. Sorry. So like so the, the last people is the last people, the, the last part of the conversation that we didn't put here at the at the end, but we put it in our comments was uh, what is you know because we need to do some scheduling for for the for the committee as a as a whole. So are we we're gonna be doing budgeting until January? We're gonna be Picking the budget, so so does this committee work? It has to be kind of in, in parallel. So we want to be appointing in December, and maybe this committee will start its work in January, so that we are like done with the budget in some way. Well, done because we're budgeting year round. We're done with this part of the budget because <coughs> configuration, whether we want it or not, includes some of that. And then the work of this committee will start in January, so that it could carry us through, so that. If we look at the previous timeline that we had, we we could make some recommendations in June or September. Maybe, Maybe. <laughs> but I I don't know. But the commitment for that committee would be you know at, at least a year, a year working yeah. with yeah. us, yeah. you know, starting in January. Mm -hmm. And you're talking once me like once monthly once, or once monthly or as needed, but once monthly. Once yeah. monthly. Yeah. At minimum. minimum. At a minimum. Would yeah. um, we want to establish like a, a general meeting time so folks can know? I'm sorry. General meeting time so folks would know how to, whether they're able to, given work commitments or other mm -hmm. commitments. Yeah, just say just, we, it's, we it's hard to know right yes. now because we don't. We haven't even afforded board members. Right. Well, but there you go. There yeah. You go. Yeah. yeah. And I, I oh, guess right. the other, right. the, and, One, and the other thing we could do is like our, we could, we could just hold our, to make it easier for us too, is our first Wednesday of the month is our configuration committee. Uh, we already have, uh, uh, no, education quality at the beginning, but we, we would do six to seven is configuration committee. And then if, seems, well, it just in short time. Well, I'm, I'm just saying people. six to seven, and then we're engaging with the community right after that work, or we're engaging with the community before, and then we do the configuration. Just, I'm just thinking about administrators in adding more time and we all work. I'm I'm asking for a housing allowance. Um, for, yeah. um, <laughs> you you so, have a band that you could use. Okay. All right, so, there's but a question on the, from uh, the floor. It, if we're not in community, but but I would allow it because you're sitting here with us. Go ahead. Yeah, because I'm here for this conversation. Yeah. So um, I just want to note um, that I think at some point we need to talk about some sort of person who can help us with communications. And specifically tap an expert. And if that's an expert from our community who can volunteer their time and help us, 
or if that's somebody that we can figure out as a board to bring on to consult with this group. But I think that that is something that needs to be considered and it needs to be considered up front at the top of this conversation because we have a communication problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. we, and, and we want it as district, what we've been talking about it. We wanted to add it to a budget and we were thinking of- I understand the background. Yes, mm -hmm. but yes. So a year, okay, and starting in January? Yeah. Okay. This time and I will, yeah. Yep. yep. <laughs> good. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. <laughs> okay, so now. Uh, Okay. So sorry, I just I'm going in between documents. Yeah. So so now we can move. Uh, uh, you have three minutes. Ed quality. I'll talk fast. Fast, fast, fast. All right. So tonight you should have received a report from us based on the schedule that I made up. Um, a report on post secondary education um, outcomes. You do not have that report, and that's not what this presentation is about because the committee needs more time to examine it. So we will be bringing that in December, but that's what our November meeting was about, was post-secondary outcomes. We're going to touch on it again in December, along with the financial literacy student learning outcome. So that is our update for now. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ursula. I'm just going to move right through it. And the finance committee, uh, the finance committee met, and if we move to page 27, we have a couple of recommended board actions that I'm going to count on my finance committee people. And I'm leaning on you, Ursula. I move and that the board authorize. Well, did you want to? Nope, the board authorized the reduction in the allocation of capital reserve funds from one million five hundred sixty one thousand seven hundred forty nine dollars to nine thousand three hundred. Nope, nine hundred and thirty two thousand and sixty six dollars for the completion of the projects as identified above and approve the district moving forward with the bid document and bidding as necessary. Thank you. Second, a second by Daniel. Any questions by board members? Any discussion? Being none, all those in favor of the motion as read, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion carries. Okay. There's one other. One, more. one more. Yeah. I move that the board approve the chain, move to change the amount to budget in the general fund to transfer to the capital reserve fund in fiscal year 2025 to 2026 as 500,000. Thank you. Moved by Ursula, second by Daniel. All those, oops, any questions? Okay. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion carries. Okay, so now we move in, if I don't have it wrong, is right to policy, right? Where I have a, a, yeah, first reading, be super steep. What? So, Go ahead. So we, so we have one policy F45 and I'm dealing, you, I'm sorry, dealing with fundraising and sales students on, on school property. This is the correct version that we um, are now forwarding to you for your consideration. Uh, fairly minor changes, but the most significant one was to remove the uh, weight of um, property ownership on jackets or other pieces of clothing that would be given to students and adults who participated in the fundraising. Instead of Stephen used to have to take the coats off the kids as they were leaving the school yeah, building, when they graduated. Was outrageous. Yeah. Um, but it, it eliminates that property aspect of the prior policy and that's a primary change um, in addition to uh, not uh, the uh, principal not needing to consult with the board on various fundraising aspects. Um, so I think those are the two major changes um, to the Policy. Okay. Hey, I see that we have some questions. Ursula. Yeah. So in so. section three F, there's a typo. That's a little pedantic, but it says solely, solely. Yeah, yeah. I saw it. I just saw it. All right. Emphasize it. Oh, we're emphasizing it? Solely, um, okay. Solely. There was no space, but I'm just, maybe we can fix that. The other question I had in section two, item B, um, we call out that the superintendent or the designee is the one who establishes the procedure. Right. And then 
in section four, it's the principals or designees. And I wanted to make sure that that's what we wanted. They're different, but I'm assuming there was a reason for that, right? One is that the principal is authorized to approve the vendors to sell on the school grounds. So that's a school decision. So we chose to do that by the principal. And then it's the superintendent who's in charge or their designee um, in making the district-wide procedures that follow this policy. So it looks like the superintendent is establishing the procedures for doing right. it and the principal is establishing the ability to do it. It was just different. So I wanted to make yeah, sure that just that's different what you're doing. Role. Yeah, we're good. That was yeah. it. Good. Can I just ask a semantic question about that? Yeah. The designee in parts 2C and 2D, is it a designee of the principal or a designee of the superintendent? Because they follow mm -hmm. 2B, which suggests the designee is that of the superintendent. Uh -huh. But the language in C and D suggests that the designee is that mm -hmm. of the principal. Mm -hmm. But could it be an assistant principal? Well, it's that's not right? the I think question. I mean, isn't is in all think, cases I, you know, the designee the I, someone I, I, would think I actually the think that it's because she's talking yeah. about the school based. Right. Yeah, that feels action. like a school. And the principal is the designating principal. it. Yeah. Yes. So they're designating. Okay. So my responsibility is set overall procedures, the principals to carry out and to make those decisions at the school at level. At the school level. Yeah. 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 I think that's how it reads. I just wanted to make yeah. sure. Yeah. Was that the intent? Okay. Mm -hmm. So we have had the first reading and questions have been answered. And we're moving right away into personnel. There's nothing to approve today. So, there is, uh, so we're gonna move right into the consent agenda. Uh, so can I have a motion to approve the minutes? Yes, so move. Thank you, Diane. Uh, Patrick has his hand up. Second. Oops. Second by Patrick. Got it. So any changes or any amendments? Seeing none, seeing none. In the screen, either all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion carries. So now we can move into our board orders. Who has the folder? Oh, Who's the Chris, lucky Chris, folder? Chris. Chris. Oh, oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. You're right. Elizabeth. <laughs> okay. Just stay on the board orders, Mr. Chris, please. Oh, she's got it. Okay. So I think it's the front page. The front page. Okay. I move to okay. accept the board order. Check warrant general date range 10 17 2024 to 11 20 2024 in the amount of eight hundred sixty two thousand five hundred and eighty four dollars and fifteen cents. Check warrant capital date range 10 17 2024 to 11 20 2024 in the amount of forty thousand seven hundred and twenty nine dollars and twenty cents. And check warrant general. Date range 10-1-2024 to 10-15-2024 in the amount of $16,098.58 for a total of $919, sorry, $919,000, excuse me, $411.93. I'll bring it to you. Lisa. Second. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> moved by Elizabeth, second by Michelle. Yes. Uh, any questions? <laughs> Hearing none, all this in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Uh, okay. Uh, future agenda items. So um, I had previously quoted a resolution, and I'm going to with withdraw that, but the purpose of the resolution was um, our chair wears multiple hats uh, and it was to respond to the uh, testimony before the legislature uh, that uh, uh, that the SB, uh, VSBA was at least recommending a policy where it would give that was not the resolution what, I'm just submitted. that's that was the resolution that I was responding let me just finish please um, that the uh, governor have the authority to consolidate school districts um, beyond board, at least that was my impression, uh, beyond board authority. Uh, and I, I didn't think that was something that we would be supporting as a board. And so, um, because our, our chair does a great job, I will tell you, you do a great job, has multiple hats, um, I think we need to take care to 
when you're testifying which hat you're wearing um, because it would it would give the impression I think that you're you know support you recommend you you're assuming a board position as opposed to a VSBA position and so that was uh, the purpose of the resolution was to kind of clarify that uh, I don't think it's needed uh, now and so I'm going to voluntarily withdraw it. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Okay. For reflection. Okay. Quiet. Let's go. Danny. No. Okay. I'm like late. No. Good. Thank you for staying. Okay. A public comment. Oh my God. I think we've sort of exhausted everybody. Oh. Okay, Becca, you have half a minute. Just okay, to... I'll be you super okay? efficient. I just want to say thank you guys for you know, being here so late. Um, so I won't say any more about that, but just a quick thing, you know, I listened a lot about the library services and I agree with a lot of the folks who spoke that they're really essential and we all know that they are about far more than books for students and teachers. And that when we fully fund the library services in our schools, you know, the librarians have time to work directly with teachers to integrate technology and critical thinking and all that sort of stuff into the lessons um, in a way that I think is more than the sum of its parts. And I also know that there is teacher, there are teachers in our district who don't have great alike colleagues within their buildings who really lean on those collaborations with the librarians um, and other allied arts teachers in their schools. So I just wanna bring attention or more thoughtfulness to this idea that when we cut those allied arts positions and those library positions that we're not actually impacting student experiences. And that I just, I think we are in a way that maybe we are not fully acknowledging because we're not necessarily limiting the time in the library that the kids are having, but we are impacting the experience they have at school um, and, and, the, and the teacher's ability to teach as effectively as possible. Um, and I just want to sort of ask a question about equity. And I know, you know, we've cut Spanish at Romney, that was a tough one. We did it in the name of equity. Um, but I, you know, I keep noticing that some, there are some schools, there is a school that has a tech, you know, much more robust tech um, FTE than the other schools. So I'm just curious about, about that and where that standard gets applied and how, um, and how it may or may not be playing out here in the, in the library um, context. So sort of a two-part question, I guess. Thank you, Becca. Uh, Noah, you have 30 seconds. <laughs> because if I give you more, you would you like to um, <laughs> Just a clarification about the Configuration Committee charge. Um, it was mentioned that the Configuration Committee will both be looking at configurations within the district and potentially also across districts. And in, in terms of that, Daniel had mentioned something about, you know, it, it's not clear in the charge whether that's the case. Is are, is the configuration committee only looking at configurations within our district, or is the configuration committee also potentially charged with um, considering things like mergers or high school consolidations with other districts as well? Thank you. So, no, the committee will be in. Or we'll have to do both things parallel, but it can be the configuration committee can be the committee. We're waiting for. A guidance from the AOE, but the configuration committee won't be the committee meeting with Montpelier. They would be informed by the work that that committee will do, but that is a completely separate committee that would be formed by, by not just Montpelier. Our district has been approached by Plainfield and approached by Barry too. So we, it might be a much broader com committee that is not just it, it's com it's in some it's informed. So I, I know that I'm making it confusing. It informs the work of the configuration committee, and some of that work needs to happen at the configuration committee. But the configuration committee won't be creating articles of agreement with Montpelier or with any other district, right? That is that work is separate, and we can't wait for that to be done for the configuration committee to have any recommendations to us, Daniel. Yeah. I yeah. think you said I was just going to emphasize that I, I, my understanding was we're we're not authorizing any sort of negotiating power or anything no. like that. This is just examining feasibility and practicability and alignment with our goals and values here. Okay, so looking at that, I think that those were all the hands. Thank you, everybody online, for being here. Thank you. All of the brave administrators that stay with us this late too, and thank you to all the board members. Yeah. And Kip, I need to give one final shout out 
to Suzanne, who I charged with creating a budget in a completely different way um, at the same time that she sent her kids off to France for the first time. And so they're having a great time. Um, but she has really jumped into this process and done a great job. And I just want to make sure that we recognize that. I know thank you is for Orca and Spencer, thank you for all you do and tech was excellent. And Lisa, thank you for being with us. Yeah. Does everybody have thank you, Killy, for being with us. With I move we adjourn. We won't see you until after Thanksgiving, so I hope everybody has a good break. So we adjourn by consensus.